Okay, so uh, this is where we are. We started out with some introduction to uh, uh, life cycle engineering from a physics of failure perspective, and that's what we're trying to build up, that perspective. So let's get rolling. Where we stopped was with some discussion of the bathtub curve, and then I started to discuss some statistical distributions uh, terminology in order to uh, uh, describe the bathtub curve a little better. Okay, so we talked about the hazard rate function, we talked about the uh, cumulative distribution function, the PDF, the probability density function, and the reliability function. And this is the, the hazard rate function is what is usually plotted in the bathtub curve on the vertical axis as a function of time. Okay, and uh, it has units of failures per unit time, so failures in uh, 10 to the power 5 hours or something. Okay. Um, so let's look at these. Uh, so the Weibull distribution has three parameters. Each of those three parameters have some meaning. So let's talk about that again one more time. I described it briefly, but let's talk about it again. So let's start with the shape parameter gamma. Uh, sorry, location parameter gamma, this one. Okay, that's the location parameter gamma. That tells you where the distribution starts. Okay, so uh, if gamma is zero, then you get a two-parameter Weibull. There's no gamma then the distribution starts at time t equals zero. If it's non-zero, then it starts at t equals gamma. Okay. Uh, so basically it's causing a kind of a rigid body shift of the distribution. Sometimes gamma can be less than zero. So if you look at your failure data, sometimes you may find that gamma is less than zero. What does that mean? Any idea? Take a guess. Right. Initial part of your process. Exactly. So you receive the product at some point in the distribution over there. So it's already been over the peak and it's actually coming down, uh, which means the shipping, handling, manufacturing, etc., has already caused some damage to the product. And you're now in this part of the descending part of the distribution. You never even saw the first part of the distribution that's already been consumed. That part of the life has already been consumed. Okay, uh, and that happens, by the way, sometimes, uh, especially in complex low volume industries like military or aerospace. Let's say the manufacturer makes a batch of 100 parts. In consumer electronics, we make them in millions of parts, right? In, uh, let's say it's a complex electronics controller box that's uh, made for some uh, aviation engine controller and the only order of 100 pieces. So what does a manufacturer usually do? And these are, because they're low volume, these are not uh, highly automated. Many of these are semi-manual hand operations and so on. So there's lots of room for manufacturing variability and errors. So what the manufacturer usually does is makes 150 pieces, tests them electrically, does accelerated stress tests for 100 hours or 200 hours. The ones that fail, they either rework or scrap. The ones that pass, they ship to the buyer. So what they've done is they've already chewed up part of the distribution of that curve, and they're shipping you what's remaining. Okay. All right. <clears throat> what does the eta do? The eta is often used. The, so the Weibull eta is often used to describe the characteristic mean of the distribution. So when we say, oh, the, my mean life expectation is so much, what you mean is my Weibull characteristic for the life expectation, uh, the eta is so many cycles, or so many hours. Uh, so that's over here. So as you change the eta, the mean of the distribution moves further and further out. Okay. Uh, beta is often used to describe the variability, as I said, the variance. So uh, uh, let's, let's leave the beta equals 1 aside for a minute. Beta equals 2, beta equals 3. The distribution gets tighter and tighter. So the standard deviation gets smaller and smaller. Beta equals 1 downwards, the curve takes a different shape. Let's go back and look at that curve, look at that plot. What happens in beta equals 1? Then it's just e to the power t divided, and let's say gamma equals 0, just for convenience. So it's just e to the power minus t over eta, right? So that's just an exponential distribution, a standard classical exponential distribution. So there you can see when beta equals 1, that's just an exponential distribution. And if beta is less than 1, then it looks like the exponential qualitatively, but drops even sharper, and we call it the hyper-exponential distribution. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, for all wear out mechanisms, beta is always greater than one because what you'll find is if you do this, sorry, if you do this uh, failure rate calculation, hazard rate calculation, when beta equals one, it'll be constant. When beta is greater than one, it'll increase. When beta is less than one, it'll decrease. So with that in mind, if you go back and relook at your bathtub curve, okay, sorry, let's go backwards here. If you relook at your bathtub curve, Here the hazard rate is decreasing, beta is less than 1. Here the ha hazard rate is a constant, beta is equal to 1. So that's described with an exponential distribution. This is a hyper exponential distribution. And here the hazard rate is increasing, so beta has to be greater than 1. So the so-called wear out phase, beta is always greater than 1. And if beta is greater than 1, then the PDF, the PDF usually looks like this when beta is greater than 1. Okay, uh, so now let's talk about, so with that out of the way, we'll come back and relook at the uh, bathtub curve from a physics of failure perspective, but I have a few slides to talk about the terminology in physics of failure before I do that. So physics of failure, as engineers, we already know what it is. It's just a way of systematically looking at what are the dominant failure mechanisms that are gonna dominate because of the materials that you've chosen, because of the design that you have, what the geometry and the architecture and the manufacturing process and because of the life cycle stresses that the product's going to see. So those three together are the inputs required for you to make decision about which failure mechanisms are going to dominate and uh, how long the product's likely to last. Okay? So without these inputs, you cannot really do a quantitative assessment of what's the dominant failure mechanism and how long will this last. So... Uh, so now let's go back and relook at the bathtub curve. I already mentioned that uh, this is beta less than one, this is beta equal to one, this is beta greater than one. So if I replot, instead of the hazard rates, if I plot the probability density function, the PDF, that's usually written as f of t as opposed to hazard rate h of t, then you can see it looks like a hyper exponential, an exponential, and then a beta greater than one wear out, okay? So those are the three sections of the bathtub curve, just replotted as a PDF. Why did I do that? That will be evident in the next, uh, next slide. Okay. Okay. And just as a quick reminder, uh, the statisticians, right, the insurance people and the uh, reliability statisticians uh, typically call this the infant mortality phase. That decrease in failure rate is the infant mortality phase. The constant failure rate is the so-called random failure stage. And then end of life wear out is an increase in uh, uh, has a great okay okay for us though from the reliability perspective and I talked about that uh, all of these any one of these could be wear out mechanisms it's just that the wear out mechanisms you're expecting at the end of life are now happening earlier on because of <coughs> poor manufacturing poor material choice so typically if the product is functioning as designed and if the designer did a good job they should all fail in this white region that means nominal manufacturing, no gross defects, uh, well-chosen materials, well-designed parts, then, and the designer designed it for, let's say, five years, then typically your failures should all start to happen around then. The reality is there's always batch-to-batch -batch variability of the manufacturing process, batch-to-batch -batch variability in the quality of incoming materials, and that's why you get these premature failures, okay? So all these blue and red failures are either manufacturing variability or ma uh, gross manufacturing defect or sometimes random events as we said. So like you s accidentally step on your cell phone or drop it in water uh, or you have a sudden power spike in your grid and your uh, fuses were not uh, well designed to protect the parts, uh, you may get some failures, okay? Uh, so some of these are random failures, the rest of them are premature failures because of uh, excessive manufacturing variability. Uh, if your design was wrong, then it wouldn't be under the blue and red, the entire white would have shifted back because all the parts would fail early, right? So the white would shift to the left if your design was wrong. These are not design problems, these are piece-to-piece -piece variability issues, okay? Uh, so how do you control these? Well, the white portion, that means where you want the white portion to start, is controlled by the designer and by the person who designed the manufacturing process. So the process engineer is also involved, because remember, the process has to be designed too. 
it doesn't just happen. You have to design the right process windows, right, t uh, think about the reflow we talked about, uh, right preheat, uh, right amount of uh, uh, time above reflow temperature. Uh, everything has to be controlled carefully, right fluxes, everything has to be controlled properly. So the manufacturing person also controls this white curve. But once you've chose, uh, come up with a good design and a good manufacturing process, you should ideally j just be on the white curve. There should be no blue failures or red failures. We still get them, partly as I said because of these random overstress events, but also because in real world there's always batch to batch variants in, especially in a supply chain that's as diverse uh, in terms of skill sets as the electronic supply chain because you're buying your parts and uh, pieces, subassemblies from God knows whom, where, and you don't know what their skill set is uh, or how the parts have been handled. We do see, because of variances like that, we do see unexpected premature failures because of batch-to-batch -batch variations. Okay? So, so once again, this is being controlled by the designer and the process designer, uh, product designer and the process designer. How do you control these? Quality control. So QC engineer is responsible for red and blue. The design engineers and the process design engineers are responsible for the white. So between the lot of them, they are supposed to minimize the red and blue as much as possible and have the white stay where it is and not move to the left or right. Okay? If it moves to the left, you have a problem. You were trying to sell a five-year product and you had a poor design. Parts are gonna, uh, products are going to fail before five years. And if it moves to the right, you're losing money. Right? Uh, you gave a five-year warranty and now your parts are lasting 10 years, you are lo losing money. Okay. <clears throat> so, the, just for continuity, I've repeated the, the PDFs of the bathtub curve. And this is what's really going on. Under the, under the hood, this is what's going on. This is what the physics of failure engineer sees. What the physics of failure engineer sees is that, okay, all these failures are happening because of a bunch of different dominant failure mechanisms. There's usually not just one failure mechanism that causes failures. In something as complex as this or this or your cell phone or your car, uh, there are a bunch of different reasons why things fail, right? Think about your car. Do you go to the shop always for the same problem? No. Sometimes you're in the repair shop because of your steering, sometimes because your uh, uh, fuel injection is not working, sometimes because your brakes are not working, sometimes because your uh, Climate controller is not working, a bunch of different problems, right? So when you have complex system, there are many different failure mechanisms. So that's what you're seeing over here. The designer has designed against multiple failure mechanisms, and these are the distributions of those failures if, they were, if and when they occur, okay? These are failure distributions of subpopulations, and uh, these are the defects. So one kind of defect may cause this failure, another kind of defect may cause, cause that distribution, the ones that are really gross defects will cause early failures right out here, and then ones that are less severe will cause midlife failures, and ones that are failing as designed will fail at the end of life under the white curve. That's what we are really seeing, okay? That's what's really going on uh, behind the scenes. Now, one word of caution. I have kind of taken a little bit of poetic license with these distributions. In reality, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but in reality, the probability density function is always normalized. So the probability density function is always normalized. So the area under it is one, always. Okay. Uh, in which case, look at these distributions. Are the areas equal to one? I mean, are the areas same under all of them? Clearly not. That distribution has a much bigger area under it than this one is. So what I've done is I've scaled these distributions by the population size. So more parts are supposed to fall into that distribution and only a smaller subset of defective subpopulations is supposed to fall under this distribution. So I've uh, scaled these. Now having said that, look at the shape of these distributions. They all wear out curves, okay? There are subpopulations that are still failing by wear out mechanisms like fatigue or electromigration or creep or corrosion, which all have a time to failure. So there's a time to failure. It's just that the time to failure for this defective subpopulation is much shorter than the time to failure for a good population. But they all wear out, uh, they, these can all be wear out mechanisms. Mixed in there may be some overstress mechanisms, like we discussed, some overstress events through the life, but many of these are just wear out mechanisms. And that's why, that's where we have some differences with the statisticians. They say, no, 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 these are random failures, these are wear out failures. No, absolutely not. We have hard scientific evidence of failure analysis we have done that says they're wrong. 
These are also wear out failures. These are also wear out failures, just subpopulations failing by wear out, early wear out, accelerated wear out because of manufacturing defect. Okay, they're all wear out mechanisms. Mixed in there are a few randoms, but the majority are early wear out failures. Uh, so in that sense, we do not buy into, in the physics of failure world, we do not buy into that terminology that status, uh, the reliability statisticians like to use, which is, uh, uh, come on, which is this terminology, uh, this terminology, right? Infant, random, and wear out. Nope, they're all wear out, okay? <clears throat> okay. All right, so some more terminology, because we'll be, I've already been throwing these around and I'll be continuing to do that. So f what do we mean by failure? Failure is when a product's no longer functioning as intended, right? So very simple. The product is designed to perform a particular function. Uh, either it may be a gross failure, like it's completely stopped. It, uh, you have an electrical short or an electrical open and the product no longer functions at all. Or it could be a more subtle failure, like, uh, my crosstalk is no longer, my noise levels are no longer acceptable because of slow degradation, corrosion, or electromigration of excessive noise or either delta I noise or excessive crosstalk, signal distortions, and the product is no longer able to perform its electrical function sufficiently. Uh, or it's overheating and the clock frequency is dropping as a result. So it hasn't stopped, but the frequency, clock frequency can no longer be maintained where it's designed to uh, function. So those are all examples of failures of various severities, okay? So the failure mode, so failure simply says product's no longer functioning. Why? Well, that's the failure mode, meaning what do you mean by it's not functioning? What is it not doing, right? So the next question as an engineer, you say, what do you mean it's failed? Customer comes back, says, I got a failed product for you. So, well, wh why do you say it's failed? Well, what's not working, okay? So they say, well, the display is flickering or my keyboard's not working or my mouse is stuck or something. Uh, so then he said, okay, let me look at it. You take a look at what's going on and you find, okay, there's a, a leakage, excessive leakage current on some su circuit card or something. And uh, you say, okay, I have a failure mode. I, uh, that's a failure mode is a particular set of uh, anomalies that's preventing the part from functioning. The mechanism is a little bit different, okay? The mechanism says, okay, what's the underlying physical process that has caused it? So for example, you say, oh, I've got too much leakage current. That's a failure mode. Then you say, why do I have excessive leakage current? Well, you may look at it and say, I've, well, I'm getting, uh, I've got excessive contaminants on my circuit card and that's why it's well. Now you're getting down to uh, electrochemical migration and that is a failure mechanism, okay? Or you say, someone says, okay, I've got a noisy signal and you look through and you find, oh, what's happened is actually you've cracked a solder joint and it, there's a high frequency signal going through it. The impedance has changed because of the partial crack and now your impedance has changed and the circuit's uh, acting funny. So the failure mode is the cracked solder joint and the resulting electrical anomaly, but the mechanism is why that crack happened. Maybe it's a fatigue crack, thermal cycling fatigue crack that's partially grown. So that fatigue is the mechanism and the crack that's happened is, and, the, and the resulting electrical anomaly is the failure mode. So there are differences in all of these terminologies. Our <coughs> job in the physics of failure world, our job is to root cause a failure down to the failure mode and then down to the failure mechanism. Because unless you can identify what's the underlying mechanism, there's no instrument or tool in the, failure, in the world of physics of failure to tell you how to cure the problem. Okay? In order to cure the problem, I need to root cause it down to the mechanism. Okay? Okay, uh, failure site. So once again, we use that word failure site in the physics of failure world very carefully. So for example, when you're doing failure analysis, you might say, oh, that capacitor is not working correctly. I measured on both sides of it and it doesn't have the right uh, behavior. Replace that capacitor. Is the failure site the capacitor? In a sense it is, but in the physics of failure world, that doesn't tell you anything. Because if you want to go back to your capacitor supplier and say, I need a better capacitor, it doesn't, it's not enough to root cause it down to the ca capacitor. You need to know what within the capacitor is causing the problem. So the capacitor manufacturer will probably take apart your capacitor, the failed capacitor, and try to find out what's going on. And they may find that uh, they've got excessive cracking inside it, the dielectrics are cracking, or you've got metal migration, dendrites that have formed within it. So they are going to root cause it down to, is it the dielectric that's the problem, or is it excessive metal migration? So you're root causing it down to a material, okay? 
So the failure site in the physics of failure world is either root cause down to a particular material where the failure is occurring. So which mechanism in which material, we need to know that. Okay, Because uh, then I have to make a decision, do I replace it with a different material? Do I treat this material differently to cure the problem? But to understand that, I've got to find out which material I'm going to attack, which is the culprit here. Sometimes it's an interface. It's not a material, it's an interface. But again, I need to know it's an interface between what two materials, because I need to know how to improve that interface. So if I don't know which two materials are meeting at that interface, I don't know how to improve it. Okay? So that's what we mean in the physics of failure world as uh, failure site. Root cause it to a mechanism and to a particular material or an interface between two materials. Fault and defect is any anomaly due to manufacturing or the raw material may have had some um, microstructural anomalies that is causing uh, uh, early failures. Okay? Anything, uh, any anomaly that causes early failure is a defect or a fault. We also make a distinction between what loading the product's going to see and what stress it experiences. The loading is the global ambient conditions, the ambient temperature or uh, the, uh, if, it, if there's vibration, you say what is the GRMS, acceleration the product seeing. Uh, those are example, or what's the relative <coughs> humidity in the environment. Those are examples of the loading, okay? Or how many watts is it running at right now? Your power supply, those are examples of loading. Stress is what is happening at that failure site, where the failure is actually occurring, what's going on over there because of that ambient load. So, for example, if the temperature is causing uh, excessive heating in a particular junction, I need to know what's the temperature at the junction, not the ambient temperature, right? So that temperature at the junction would be an example of stress. Or because of excessive vibration, if I'm failing leads on a component, I need to know what's the mechanical stress in that component, not the GRMS that the products see. So the stress in that lead is the stress, the GRMS the product seeing is the load. How do we know the stress? you have to do some kind of stress analysis. So either you do a thermal analysis or you do a moisture absorption analysis to find out how moisture is getting from ambient to wherever the failure is occurring, wherever your electro -migration is, uh, electrochemical migration is happening. Or for the given GRMS of the product, uh, how do you find the stress in the lead? You have to analyze that, uh, do a mechanical stress analysis. So there has to be some kind of analysis. It could be a simple closed form analytic equation if it's a simple geometry, simple material properties. Uh, and we'll see some very simple examples of that. Uh, 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 you already saw some thermal analysis examples. Uh, uh, I'll do today a simple stress and solder joint kind of an example. Okay? Or it could be if it's more complex, you do numerical. You saw examples of numerical analysis. Same thing in mechanical. We do finite element analysis for moisture absorption, for electrical fields, for mechanical fields, for thermal fields. Any of those can be numerically solved. Or maybe you don't want to do an analysis, maybe you just want to build a prototype and put sensors and just measure it, right? All of those are, so if I have an ambient condition, I have a given power dissipation, I measure the temperature with an infrared microscope or something. So uh, bottom line, there's a transformation involved, some kind of a mapping function involved, which is either by analysis and simulation or by measurement, okay? Okay, so, in this is the final body of knowledge that the physics of failure person needs. To apply it, they need to know how to do stress analysis and all the rest of it and accelerated testing and all the rest of it. But this is the fundamental body of knowledge that the physics of failure uh, engineers need. But the, once you say that, so I'm back to this chart. These are the dominant failure mechanisms. There's about 15 to 20 that we have seen over our 30-year uh, experience in electronics. Uh, and this is uh, some of them, some of the more dominant ones. But once again, it's very clear, all the experts sitting in the room, no one person is an expert in all of these, right? So it's impossible for me to be an expert. I'm, I'm up here, I'm a mechanical engineer. I don't have, I have some rudimentary knowledge of these areas, but if there's really a challenging problem here, I go call in the corrosion engineers and the chemical engineers and have them help me, right? So go back to the analogy in the uh, medical industry, we said the doctor is the physics of failure uh, person in the, uh, in the medical industry. It's the same thing, right? You don't have any one doctor that's a specialist in cardiology, ne uh, nephrology, neurology, urology, you know, or gastroenterology. You have separate experts for each one of them. No one guy is an expert in all of them. You do have a 
family practitioner or a general practitioner who has some rudimentary knowledge of all of them, enough to know when to call in the right expert, right? They can root cause it down to, okay, this seems to be a corrosion problem, call the corrosion guy. This seems to be an electromigration problem, call the electromigration guy, right? So that's the job of the physics of failure reliability engineer on any team is to be that first gatekeeper to figure out which expert do I need on this problem, okay? Okay, now once you call the expert, just like in the medical industry, no two experts are going to completely agree on what exactly is going on and what exactly is the fix. But that's the nature of the work, right? So you call in experts, you get a couple of opinions, and you come up with uh, the best consensus you can find, and you uh, uh, opt for a treatment. So, uh, and is the treatment always perfectly correct? No, sometimes partially correct, sometimes wrong, but that's the nature of the world. There's, uh, knowledge is not complete, knowledge is partial, right? Okay. Uh, so, few characteristics of each failure mechanism I've listed. One, there are quantitative models for each and every mechanism I've listed, there are quantitative models, okay? The, the experts over the year, the, the bad news is there are too many models. Just like I said, the experts don't necessarily agree. So if you talk about fatigue, one set of experts say, I use this model, and I'll show you some examples later. Another expert say, no, 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 that model doesn't work, I use this model. At the end of the day, you have to, uh, Typically, we use multiple models, see what the predictions are, take the best case or worst case scenario and design to that. So A, there are quantitative models. B, if it's a truly physics of failure model, then the model constants will be material properties, not a property of the particular design, but a property just of the material, which means if I use copper in this product versus this product versus in a power electronics versus uh, uh, somewhere else, if, as long as the copper composition is the same, the properties in all these failure models for copper will be the same. Same fatigue constant, same creep constant, same uh, uh, resistivity, same uh, conductance, uh, uh, same thermal conductivity. All the, as long as you're not changing the composition the proper, and the process, sorry, the process also sometimes affects properties. So as long as you're using similar processes and similar uh, compositions, the properties will not change. They're the same across all designs and all applications. So that's a characteristic of these. Why is that important? Because now I can measure those material constants by just taking material level test specimens, coupons, test coupons, go into a lab and measure the properties. I don't have to build products to measure those properties, okay? Which means by the time my designer is gonna sit down and design and build products, they have all the material properties. Their, their, uh, their, their toolkit, their design toolkit has all the material properties they need. Uh, so uh, model, material properties, and the second set of inputs in there are the stresses. Remember we talked about we have to do, uh, we have to find stress levels at the failure sites? Well, those stresses are what go into these models to predict failure. Take a simple example. Let's say uh, I want to do uh, 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 stress migration or stress voiding and temperature is a driver. We do a thermal analysis using methods that uh, uh, Professor Anand Roop talked about, and uh, that gives me the temperature at the failure site. Then I use input that temperature, not the ambient temperature, the local temperature that we get out of the calculation at the failure site, input that in the model, pull out the material constants, and I can predict how long it takes for cavities to grow in, let's say, aluminum metallization, okay, as an example. Uh, so stresses are needed, material properties are needed, quantitative models are needed, and they're all available. The good news, and the bad news is that there's a rich body of literature in every one of these, okay? Multiple models, uh, access to uh, groups of experts who have studied each one of these mechanisms have been studied for years and years and years and years. And none, every mechanism I've listed over here is not just something we suddenly discovered yesterday. It's been around longer than electronics has in some cases, okay? So these are well-known mechanisms and the rich body of literature in each and every one of these. And the bad news is that there's too rich a body of literature sometimes in every one of these, and they don't always necessarily agree with each other, okay? Okay, uh, so that is the world of the physics of failure. That's your sandbox. But this is where we live, this is where we make our, uh, you know, live or die. So if you do it wrong, you die. Okay, so I keep talking about these models. I've just listed a list of one, two, three, four, five, six, just six examples here where uh, there are extensively used well-known models that electronics 
physics of failure community uses regularly. For example, fatigue. We talked about wire bond fatigue. We talked about solder joint fatigue. We talked about metal fatigue on uh, printed circuit cards. Uh, we talked about connector fatigue. All of those are dealt with with fatigue model. And there are multiple fatigue models. I've listed one of them here, the coffin Manson, the Manson coffin model. And as long as it's fatigue, it's that model. I don't care if it's in wire bonds. I don't care if it's in die attach. I don't care if it's in connectors. It's that same model we use every time. Okay? It works for everything. As long as it's fatigue, it works. So it's not a design specific model, it's a mechanism specific model. If that mechanism is happening, no matter which material, no matter which uh, uh, product, that model works. Okay? Of course, depending on wh what the material is that's fatiguing, my m model constants will change. The model will not change, the model constants will change. Now, now the, that's the first level answer. Now the subtleties, the caveats. If it's, for example, a creeping material, a viscoplastic material, and that is uh, fatiguing due to cyclic loading, then the model gets a little more complicated. And I'll show you some examples. So if it's a plastic or solder, something that creeps a lot at our operational temperatures, then you have to use a more com complex version of this model, which is also in the literature. People have been doing creep fatigue analysis for years and years and years. There are high temperature metals being used everywhere in engine exhaust, combustion chambers, high temperature superalloys being used everywhere. So the community, the fatigue community, has long ago solved that problem of how do we uh, handle high temperature creep fatigue. All we've got to do is apply to electronics. Because believe it or not, electronics are high temperature product because you're so close to the melt temperature of some of these materials. Electronics are operating the same homologous temperature domain as high temperature superalloys are in combustion chambers and exhausts. That's the domain of operation we have. Yes. So, um, when I said this, uh, physics of failure uh, comes into my design, I feel like I'm, I'm designing a thing. Excellent. I'm going to answer that question with a flow chart. Hold that thought and we'll come back to it. It's at every step of the design, from concept design all the way to maintaining the product. Every step has to be physics of failure, and we'll talk about it. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So examples of models. So I talked about uh, fatigue. Similarly, for corrosion, there are numerous, numerous models depending on what specific kind of corrosion. The one that gets used most commonly in uh, electronics is either the Peck model or the Howard model. Okay. Uh, electromigration, again, it's the actual physics of that is very, very complex and people do PhDs after PhDs on it, but the designer has simple models that they use. Typically, the black model or some similar model gets used for electromigration and so on. You get the picture. So once again, the actual physics of how fatigue happens in the microscale is very complex, but that's not what we do here. We take some simple phenomenological models that's uh, generic enough that can be used for any fatigue anywhere and the model constants are material properties. So that's the last aspect of it. When we say there are material properties and I said, oh, you can design a test coupon and go measure it, well, we all know as engineers that the results can vary depending on what test, kind of tests you run. I can choose a different kind of coupon and I may get different kinds of results. So they're standards. So you've got to open up ASTM standards or uh, IPC standards, or IEC standards, JEDEC standards. They actually tell you how to design test coupons and what kinds of tests to run to get material properties that can be used as model constants here. Okay? So there's some amount of standardization used to uh, uh, extract these model constants. Okay, and, and this uh, column lists, uh, well, this column lists typically where we see these failure mechanisms in electronics. This column talks about what are the stresses that drive those. So for example, cyclic fatigue is driven by cyclic deformation. But cyclic deformation in electronics can happen due to a lot of reasons. Just mechanical loading, I'll give you a simple example. You're punching keys on your, uh, well, the screen on your cell phone. Well, that's con constantly bending the display, okay? And or even when you have an even bigger display like a tablet or a laptop, when you're pressing on it, you're actually physically bending by a few microns, well, tens of microns, the display. Uh, I briefly flashed up yesterday a cross-section of how complex the laminated structure of a display is. There's the, uh, all the color LEDs or LCDs, there's uh, complex circuitry in between, uh, glass, polymers all stacked up together, interconnects stacked up together, well you're constantly bending those. Okay? Uh, that's cyclic deformation and that can cause failures. But that's not the only thing that's de deforming the display, that's just simple mechanical load. Uh, but each time you temperature cycle, because that laminated stack has so many different materials, each of which is expanding by different amounts, that is causing deformation of the display. If the 
polymers in the display absorb moisture, they swell. The rest of the materials don't swell, the polymers swell. So again, you have expansion mismatches. Uh, so moisture can induce mechanical deformation. Electrical power dissipation, well, that causes, so that just means cyclic power, okay? That means in turn cyclic temperature, which in turn means cyclic deformations, okay? So cyclic deformations can happen due to a variety of different environmental and operational uh, drivers, and so on. So moisture requires, uh, sorry, corrosion requires moisture, uh, voltage gradients, and temperature. Electromigration requires current density and temperature, and so on and so forth. So this lists the various stresses, and those symbols are all defined at the bottom, okay? Okay, moving on, and uh, I'm going to need a few slides to come back to. Actually, this, uh, this session ends with how do you tie all this together? Where do you, when and where do you do your physics of failure? So there's a flow chart at the end, so you have to be patient till then. <laughs> okay, all right. We have been through this chart before. This basically says, okay, if I'm going to take these, I mean, I have complex environments here. Take temperature. We saw temperature may have a very complex variation throughout a day of, in this particular case, it's a laptop, okay? that's being carried around from work to home and back again, um, home to work and back again. Uh, so question is, what do I do with that load? So, th sorry, this, this is the load, but how do I input that in the model? Well, you've got to convert it to stresses, and uh, this model in particular requires those stresses in a particular form. It wants a cyclic value, cyclic range, so that's what I've done. It's a cyclic range of temperature that's over here, and it's a distribution histogram, distribution of cyclic range of temperature. And then some mechanisms, like this one, don't care about the cyclic range. They want the uh, absolute value of temperature, okay? So th there we have made a distribution of the absolute value of the temperature during that day. So how many times are we at 30 degrees C, or how often are we at 30 degrees C, how often are we at 40 degrees C, and so on, okay? So those are the distributions that I then input into, well, convert those to stresses and input into these models, okay? So that's a kind of a post-processing we have to do of loads that we uh, measure in the field. Okay, um, and then comes converting these to stresses. So this is still temperature, I need to convert it to stresses, so you would have to do some form of stress analysis. So here, for example, this was an automotive body control module. We were doing combined temperature and vibration testing of those, so we're measuring all the temperatures outside, but then I need to know the temperatures at each of the chips so we do a uh, dissipation and ambient temperature analysis. This was an accelerator test chamber. So the ambient was being varied up to about uh, 85 degrees C. So we did a thermal analysis and found out the uh, uh, peak temperatures at each of the ICs and uh, everywhere in the circuit card. So you can see they're all color coded by the temperature that they achieved, okay? So that's that analysis to go from that ambient 85 degrees C to the temperature at each chip uh, or each part that is the stress analysis in this case, or load transformation. Uh, take the vibration. So the same part was also in our vibration chamber. And so this is the housing. Inside the housing is the circuit card, which is f uh, the blue points are how it's fixed to the housing, okay? And then we subject that to the vibration that we are ex ex uh, using to excite that part. And then we look at the deformations. The circuit card has deformations. You can see the maximum deformation is right in there because that's where we have some micro relays, heavy micro relays. So the highest deformation is over there. Uh, and then we, uh, uh, so this is the same card, just the contour of the curvatures. You can see what that looks like. And then we look at the power spectral density of uh, uh, at what frequencies are these deformations occurring. So, and that's because we need to know the loading rate. So the frequencies then convert it into a loading rate. And then we do the anal uh, failure analysis. Okay. Um, so let's now talk about, so in the physics of failure world, when I have a product like this, what am I looking for? Well, what are all the competing opportunities for failure? Well, if I'm a IC manufacturer, then that is my product, right? Uh, and I worry about uh, where, where all can failures occur. Well, the metallization can have various failures. We've talked about many mechanisms, metal migration, electromigration, uh, hillock formation from electromigration. We haven't talked about contact spiking. We've talked about SDDV, that's the same as constraint cavitation or stress migration. We've talked about corrosion. So those are the various things that can happen in the metallizations in your chip, okay? Then the semiconductor and the, uh, uh, the semiconductor layer, may, I mean, uh, uh, device 
may also have some failures. The, the silicon can fracture. Uh, you could have uh, thermal breakdowns of uh, the semiconductor materials. Uh, or the oxide layer may have error uh, problems, uh, time-dependent dielectric breakdown, electrical overstress, ESD, slow trapping, hot electrons. We've talked about some of those. Then uh, you may have other issues. And we've not talked about surface charge spreading or second breakdown, those additional mechanisms we haven't had time. Uh, we ha have talked about ionic contamination. That changes device characteristics. Then the interfaces between the device and the substrate and the uh, oxide, you get hot electrons leaking over there. So those are examples of failure mechanisms. So as the IC manufacturer, or designer rather, I worry about where are all these uh, possible sites where I may have these failures, and my job is to make sure product is robust enough that none of these failure mechanisms happen in these sites within any reasonable period of time that my uh, customer is going to use this pr product for. Okay? So to me, I meaning to the physics of failure uh, designer, this part is we, care, we do care about the electrical design and the traces and everything, but at the end of the day, it's just a collection of failure sites, competing failure sites and failure mechanisms. And our job is to make sure that we do the stress analysis, input the stresses, and make sure that the product's not going to fail by any of these mechanisms at any of these sites in any reasonable period of time. What's reasonable? What the cu cu customer is expected to use this product for. Okay. Okay. Same thing at every level. If I'm a package designer, not a not a semiconductor level person, but a package builder, so I buy uh, chips and I just package them. Uh, again, I have to worry about all the potential failure sites and competing failure mechanisms. So the interconnects, okay, whether they be wire bonded or flip chipped or tabbed, uh, the outer casing, the mold compound that's being used over here, it's either a plastic casing or hermetic casing, the possible failure mechanisms there, the leads, the lead frames, lead seals, solder joints, all of those are possible failure, the substrate that I'm using there, all of those are possible failure sites. And we know from experience what are the various failure mechanisms that can dominate. And my job as that package designer is to make sure that none of those uh, happen. I choose right materials uh, and use the right models for each of these to ensure that failure is way out there and not going to happen within the lifetime of the product. Okay. So same thing at the printed assembly level. So again, uh, the printed wiring board material itself, the circuitry that's on the board, all the solder joints and attachments on it, uh, those are all potential failure sites. They're failure mechanisms that are listed over here. In some cases, we've listed failure modes rather than mechanisms, but the point is there are models available for each and every one of these failure modes that the board designer can actually run models, computer simulations, and make sure that there are no weak links in that design that'll fail too early. Okay? So all the plated through holes, solder joints, the interfaces, uh, all of the connectors, all of those can be designed. Okay, once again, when do you do it? Where do you do it? The it's the designer's job, and we'll talk about it. Okay, <clears throat> um, in your case, it's the mechanical designer's job. So your designer, design team doesn't just have electrical designers, they have mechanical designers, and some non-mechanical, like people who are worrying about corrosion and other aspects. All of them have to be examining the design with their CAD tools to make sure not just the electrical functionality is okay, but the mechanical functionality is okay, the corrosion functionality is okay, uh, electrochemical migration functionality is okay. So there are models and tools to do all of that. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip over these slides. So these are just information and resource slides for you. It basically says of all these mechanisms and modes that we've been talking about, which ones dominate at high temperature, which ones dominate at low temperature, which ones dominate when there's the cyclic cycling of those which ones dominate in mechanical loads like vibration or shock, et cetera. Uh, why did we put it in this format? It's sometimes useful, uh, not just to the designer. So if designers, someone says, oh, I'm going to design this electronics for high temperature application for downhole drilling or under the hood automotive. Well, I immediately know that's, those are my biggest challenges. I can focus my attention on those, right? Or uh, someone has designed product for a high temperature and I need to go run accelerated tests for it. I know which failure mechanisms will dominate at the high temperature part of my testing. Or if I'm doing cyclic loading, I know which failure mechanisms will dominate in my test for uh, cyclic loading and so on. So there's a correlation between which failure mechanisms am I trying to target and what load should I use to do that. Okay. Okay. Um, 
let's talk about this slide. I'll talk only about half of it, not all of it, just the top half, okay? So let's focus our attention over here. In fact, I'm going to zoom into this a little bit. In fact, let's see, if in presentation mode, can I zoom? Okay, now it goes back into regular mode, but that's okay. Okay, let's talk about this uh, this graph first, okay? This, it's not been grouped. No. Sometimes the touch screen works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay. So this is the classical concept of stress strength interference, okay? So this talks about failure risks. So when are things likely to fail? When you have stressed it too much, right? When you have stressed it beyond what the designer had indented, you fail the part. So how does the designer look at it? Designer says, well, I need to worry about how strong the part is, and I need to worry about what stress it's going to see. And I'm using that word stress and strength uh, uh, generically. For example, if it's uh, electrical stresses, uh, maybe I need to worry about dielectric strength and uh, voltage gradient. Those could be my stress and strength. If it's mechanical, it's just mechanical strength and mechanical stress. Okay? So if it's uh, thermal, it could be the melt temperature of the material or phase transition, glass transition temperature of the material and the temperature that it's going to uh, be exposed to. So uh, that's what I mean by stress and strength. The, the point of this is that in reality, the product is not just going to see one stress. There will be a distribution of stress levels the product's going to see. Different users put it through different stress levels. Same user puts it through different stress levels at different times. So the product has to survive some distribution of stress. Same thing with the strength. The product doesn't have just one strength level. So if you're talking about dielectric strength of, let's say, capacitor dielectrics, it's not just one value. There's a mean value and some distribution. There's always some statistical distribution due to manufacturing variability. So your strength is a distribution. That's shown by the green distribution over here. Where's my cursor? OK, that's shown by the green distribution. Let's, let's go with this green distribution. And stress distribution that I'm expecting is in red. The, you can calculate the probability of failure by calculating the probability that stress is going to exceed the strength. That happens over this, where this uh, intersection is happening. That's where you have a finite probability that the stress may exceed the strength. Okay? So bigger that overlap, higher the probability. You actually have to integrate those distributions to calculate that probability. But qualitatively, uh, more the overlap between those, higher that probability. Okay? So here's two distributions. Here is strength, this is stress, here is strength. So this distribution has a bigger intersection. If you calculate the, uh, integrate the probability that stress will exceed strength in that region, you get some particular number. Whereas if the strength distribution is here, so this is strength and this is stress, now you have a bigger intersection. And if you do the same integration here, that uh, pr uh, probability of stress exceeding the strength, you find that it's a much higher probability. So your reliability for this material weaker material will be much lower than the reliability for this material, which is a stronger material. Okay? So that's classical stress strength interference theory. So that's that interference between the two distributions that allows you to estimate the probability of failure. What does that mean? Well, the designer always tries to pick a material that is going to be well sufficiently to the right of the expected stress distribution. So that First, the designer has to know what stress levels you're going to expose it to. If you tell someone, design me a reliable product, the first thing they're going to say is, well, what are you going to do with, it, with that product? Because how reliable it's going to be depends on what stresses you're going to uh, expose it to. So I need to have some estimate of the stress level the product's going to see. Based on that, the designer will pick materials that are strong enough to withstand that stress. That means the probability of failure should be small enough. So if they use a weak material, yeah, there'll be more failures. They use a strong material, there'll be uh, less failures. So that is a concept of how you design materials that are strong enough to survive all your stresses. Uh, this particular example is for overstress mechanisms. Uh, there's corresponding examples in uh, 
uh, analogies and wear out, which we won't go through today because it's going to take a little longer to do that. Uh, there's, so, uh, so that's the job of the designer. Then comes the manufacturing guy, uh, the quality guy, sorry, who says, wait a minute, that's what the designer intended. That green, that narrow green distribution is what the, oops, we got to go back. Yeah, okay. So the quality guy then comes in and says, okay, this is what the designer had intended. That uh, the designer had picked a distribution that has very low interference with the stress, so nice uh, separation, low probability of failures, so that's a strong, robust design. But then because of piece-to-piece -piece variation, batch-to-batch, -batch, some batches come out with a lot of variation, and now, although the mean has not changed, it's the same material, okay, mean has not changed, but now because of poor quality, there's the weakest specimen in that batch is way weaker than the strongest specimen in that batch. Too much piece-to-piece -piece variation. That's poor quality. Not the designer's fault, the designer did a great job. The quality guy goofed up, okay, the manufacturing guy goofed up, or the raw material that got supplied was not as per designer spec. So someone made a mistake somewhere, and now you have excessive variability and you're back to too many failures. So either the design or the quality can get you in trouble, okay? Okay, go back. Okay, now comes so where do we do all this physics of failure, okay? So, where, uh, and I'm gonna draw a very simplified version of how you develop a product, okay? Where does it start? Well, you're designing a product to meet a certain need, so the first thing is what does the customer expecting? So, by and the customer could be a group. You're d designing for cell phone users in, of age group uh, 15 to 25 in uh, China, okay? So, Every demographic has their particular user prof usage profile, so you need to have that kind of information. That sets the constraints for what your product has to meet. So the design attributes of a product for that demographic is probably going to be different from uh, 50 to 60 year olds using it in, I don't know, Argentina or something, which is a different weather, different climate, different age group different sets of uh, tools that they're going to use over their software tools they're going to use over there. So I just intentionally just picked two diverse groups. The customer's requirements in those two groups are not going to be the same. And where the concept design initially starts is to convert those customer expectations into a set of design expectations and design constraints. So it translates into what functions the product has to perform, what are the reliability expectations, and that has to do with the fact that uh, the stresses that one demographic is going to apply are probably different. Maybe the younger age group is doing a lot of gaming, high-end software, a uh, lot of outdoor usage. Maybe the older population in Argentina has got much simpler function. They're just using it as a phone and text message and maybe a little bit of internet, not a lot of gaming, high-end uh, software tools, and they're, uh, they're mostly indoor uh, usage. They're not, they are not walking down the street uh, with their phone in their face all the time, maybe, you know. So different kinds of uh, uh, usage conditions. Uh, so all of that has to translate into what constraints, design constraints you're going to, so your design team gets together first and sets up, builds up the design constraints based on that. Uh, there's one crucial step missing over here. Whoops, one crucial step missing over here. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, benchmarking at that stage against competitor products, okay? So if I'm going to build something for this demographic, what products are already targeting them and what is going to be the distinguishing feature of mine? How am I going to sell mine? So right at that stage, we also come up with uh, new functionalities, which means new design constraints sometimes that we want to target towards that population. Okay, so that sets up your initial candidate design concepts. And at that stage, we do a very early, high-level FMMEA. What's FMMEA? Well, FMEA is a well-used concept in the reliability world. It stands for failure modes and effects analysis. So there what you're doing is you're doing a very high level, just a concept design, building blocks. Here's my power electronics. Here's my battery supply. Here's my display. Uh, here's my memory card. Here's my logic, et cetera, et cetera. Here are my sensors. And you're trying to do a very high level assessment of what are the vulnerabilities of each? What is the likelihood that the sensor will fail? What effect will that have on the rest of the products or what is the likelihood that I may get a failure of a connector? What likelihood, how does that ripple through uh, 
failures in the rest of the product. So it's uh, basically a failure mode and what effect does it have on the end functionality and the tools available to do that. We are not, we, in this workshop, we're not talking about that. Okay, but the point is that right at that stage, people narrow down design concepts based on how well it survives that FMNEA uh, exercise. Okay. So now you have a preliminary design. It's still uh, system level, architecture design, pretty high level. You haven't done the detailed design. Okay. And that's where we start to do some preliminary physics of failure already. So if I, for example, I may say, oh, I'm going to buy a display from Samsung. Well, some people will go take that display and uh, run some initial high-level analysis or run some uh, high-level experiments, look at some failure rates, and try to do some initial physics of failure-based modeling right at that stage. So mostly done at that stage for parts that you're going to buy from your supply chain to put into your product. So that's often called, that kind of testing is often called EV testing, engineering verification testing. So this is very high level, just prototypes, uh, few pieces. Uh, you don't have a full final design in place yet. You're just testing the te individual technologies and subsystems that you're going to use to see how viable they are for your application. Okay. Okay, uh, now you get into detailed design. You are now building up your circuit designs. You are picking components, figuring out who to buy it from. Uh, uh, and th now you're going to start to put together in actual uh, configurations on your circuit card. This is where you need the design tools to do detailed POF. Okay? Without the tools, you can't do it. So we talked about sometimes you do finite element analysis to see will my circuit card as, de as I've designed it. Uh, will it have temperature hotspots? Will it survive vibration loading? Uh, what kinds of EMI issues am I going to have? So that's where you need the tools to do that kind of analysis. So that is where the bulk of the POF gets done. It starts right here, okay? but this is where the bulk of it gets done. But it's absolutely in the design team. You haven't built prototypes yet. There's no hardware. It's just concept designs on a computer. Not concept, designs on a computer. This is the time to compare design A to design B, change your materials, pick the most... Uh, critical one, uh, but most uh, robust one, change your circuit design, change your interconnect design in order to meet the lifetime targets, okay, for the stresses that you're, you're expecting from your customer base. Okay, uh, then you build the hardware. So you've done that physics of failure design, then you build prototypes, and as always, we engineers, we don't trust models, right? Uh, the modeler might have trusted it, we don't. We say, let's go do some testing, right? So our job is to be skeptical and uh, hard-nosed about it. So you make some hardware based on this design, and you go test. And if you get some failures, you know the designer failed somewhere. They missed some failure mechanism in their analysis or did the analysis wrong. The models weren't calibrated properly. They used wrong material properties or something, and it didn't survive the testing. Uh, there's also this question of what testing? How did you design the test? Well, that too is des designed based on physics of failure methods. Because remember, we're going to do accelerated testing. I'm not going to test for five years. My user is going to use it for five years. I'm not going to test for five. I'm going to test for a few weeks at most. Well, I need to use much higher stress levels. How much higher? Well, the physics of failure models tell us how much higher. If I want to change life from five years to five days, the physics of failure model will tell you for that design how much do I need to uh, increase the stress level so the time to failure drops by that much, okay? So, and we'll see examples of that later. So that's how you design the DV test, then you run the DV test, and if something fails over there, you loop back. That's what that red loop is. You say, whoops, we got a problem. Either my design is wrong, or my acceleration factor was wrong. Somewhere, my model did not work right, okay? So you go back and relook at it, calibrate everything, and you loop back until it survives DV testing. If you've got good physics of failure models and you've done a good robust design, chances are you're not going to get a lot of failures. At most, maybe one iteration back, maybe two. If you're doing more than that, you're in deep trouble. Your physics of failure capabilities are just not up to mark and uh, uh, your competitors are going to beat you to the market. You don't have time for that many iterations. Okay? So that's why the modeling and simulation is so important because the old in the old days, that's what used to happen. That whole step of modeling and simulation in the middle was missing. You would build the part, you would test it, and you would test it to just some standards that you pull out of handbooks. You have no idea how much to accelerate the stresses. You don't know what the acceleration factors are. You just test per some standard. If it survived it, you say, fine. If it didn't survive that standardized test, you would just go back and keep ruggedizing arbitrarily until it survived. 
Uh, and that meant you would sometimes have three, four, five iterations, and that's what caused so many months of development time. Now you've got weeks of development time, no longer months. Okay? You don't have that luxury of all those trial and error iterations. You've got to get it right the first time. That's why you need the simulation tools. Okay? Okay. Then comes the issue of, okay, these were prototypes I built in my shop, not in the manufacturing plant, but in my, uh, in my lab. These were just a few prototypes that the design team built in their lab. Uh, is that same thing going to hold good in the manufacturing floor? Because their processes are in general a little bit different. So now you've designed the process. You've designed the product. Now you design the process. You're calling the process engineers. You tell them, look, I got a good design. I have proof of concept. It's a live DV. It's your job now to make sure that you manufacture it correctly on the shop floor and uh, not mess it up, right? And they look at it, they look at the process, they come up with the process chart, and they say, you are a dumb designer. This can never be manufactured in a high volume. Reasons X, Y, Z, this is not a manufacturable design, go back and redesign it. So sometimes that happens. You came up with a non-manufacturable, it, it can be hand fabricated in the lab, but there's no way to, that part can be made in high volume manufacturing and still have good reliability. So you'd have to redesign it for manufacturability. On the other hand, if you had that process engineer right in the design team there, that mistake would never have happened. The process engineer would have stopped you right there and said, no, 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 that's a bad design. You've got to do it this way. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to do high volume manufacturing when you go later. Okay? So the point is not just the physics of failure designers, but also the manufacturing engineers have to be on that product development team. Uh, so bottom line, if you've got a manufacturable part, you go ahead and you've designed, and the process engineers have designed the right manufacturing process for it. Then you make the first few pieces that on the manufacturing line, not in your lab anymore, off of the high volume manufacturing line, and you pull out a few hundred pieces as your initial prototypes, and you test those to make sure to reconfirm that yes, the process indeed works for this, and the products are going to be reliable as it comes out of the high volume manufacturing line. So that's called PV testing, process verification testing. And every good company that we know does all of these. They do EV testing, they do DV testing, they do PV testing. All of these are done. This is, this is the real world, okay? Okay, and then by the time you're done with that, you know that you've got a good design, you know that you've got a good nominal process. All you gotta do is keep that recipe going batch to batch. If you accidentally lose that recipe in any particular batch, that means one machine on your manufacturing line is suddenly malfunctioning, or your raw material supplier gave you a poor batch without your knowledge, then you may suddenly run into a problem. If none of those happen, you're going to produce good products, okay? But the reality is those things do happen. Manufacturing machines do slowly develop problems, and suppliers do often, not often, sometimes give you bad batches. So we got to make sure that batch to batch, lot to lot, uh, the quality is being maintained. That's why we also need the quality control guy, okay? So the quality control guy has to manage the process. Okay, and then of course all of this has to be documented. Uh, why documented? because the next generation product is going to benefit from all the lessons learned in this process and they're going to avoid hopefully many of these mistakes in the next generation product. That's how the next generation product will make it to market faster and cheaper. Because remember the next generation product is going to be a lot more complex. It's going to take them more time to develop. The more lessons they can learn from this generation product, the easier it makes their life in the next generation product. So that's why the documentation and capturing these knowledge in terms of models that you've used answers that you have obtained is so important for the next generation. And that's why we're calling it cradle to cradle. Cradle to grave of this generation helps the cradle of the next generation. Okay? And then the final step is after you've fielded the product, you are relying on the fact that you did your job exactly right. You gauged your customer's requirements exactly right. You came up with the right concepts. You did the right design. You got the right process. And you've done the right QC. If all of that holds, the products should last as expected in the field. The reality is that's not always the case, okay? Two things can go wrong. They may be individual pieces that are still defective uh, that have made it through because your quality control guy is probably sampling five out of every thousand that are going out. Well, what about the remaining 995? There could be some defective uh, pieces in there that skip missed, number one. Number two, you had some initial estimates of what your user is going to do. And I gave you this example, the Microsoft has some user model in their mind when they design that product. Well, you and I probably don't fit that model the same way. I am maybe on one end of that spectrum, you may be on another end of that spectrum. And for you, it may last two years, for me, it may last a few months. Okay, so 
real-time monitoring of at what rate is the product degrading is extremely important for both reasons. One, because my piece may have had one of those 995 defective, I mean, one of the defective ones out of those 995, yours may not, so yours will last better. Two, I may be abusing it more than you are, yours will last better. So although came out of the same batch, same design, same manufacturing process, same quality control, time to failure may be, uh, expectations may, uh, experiences may be different for different users. It's the same thing in the real world, right? Uh, even people who are born with, you know, similar demographics, similar genes, may have entirely different health issues. Depends on their lifestyle, depends on their specific genetic defects. Uh, although they have overall similar genes, same family, same uh, upbringing, uh, we see piece-to-piece -piece variation, right? What do we do over there? Well, the doctor doesn't treat everyone saying, oh, you came from the same family, same mm -hmm. treatment for you. Uh, do doctor personalizes the treatment, runs tests on you, says, okay, you've got this issue, and, but your twin brother or sister has a different issue. So one treatment plan for your twin and different treatment plan for you. And as your health changes over time, they keep changing the treatment plan, right? So it's a personalized, real-time, adaptable healthcare system. That's how, what we are all used to in a, in a good healthcare system. That's what your electronics need. That's what your hardware needs. You need personalized healthcare for your system. That means you need sensors and monitoring real time on every piece, on your piece, my piece, all the thousand pieces, so that we know how each of those 995 are faring throughout their lifetime. And as they start to suffer from various illnesses, we treat them accordingly. That means we either repair them or we change the functional <coughs> stresses. We protect them based on their current condition. That is prognostics and health, real-time prognostics and health management. So that's the last part of this physics of failure process. Uh, and where does physics of failure play a role, role in that? It's in the diagnostics. It's, I see something going wrong, like my display is not working. I need to know why. What do I do? Which parts have to be replaced? So the sensors inside tell me what's going wrong and which part I need to replace. And, and the uh, uh, symptoms uh, and the sensors together allow me to do the diagnostics. And once you've done the diagnostics, you can do a prognostic with the physics of failure model. You see uh, the diagnostic tells you, uh, well, the part has partially degraded. That's why you're seeing these problems. And you have currently, the model tells you, you've used up about 70% of the usable life of this product. It's got only 30% remaining. And that 30% for me may be a few weeks. For you, that may still be a few months, depending on our usage. Uh, but it tells you, based on your usage pattern, how much life is still remaining. That's the science of prognostics and health monitoring. It uses, combines physics of failure know-how with a lot of data analytics, and I talked about that before. Uh, if there's time left at the end of the day today, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I suspect we'll run out of time before that. Okay, uh, that's the physics of failure, role of physics of failure, from every step to every step, okay? Uh, and again, the analogy I keep drawing is the human system again. Where does the doctor play a role in you? From before you're born, right? W literally womb to tomb. From before you're born, and you don't want to think about life after you, but the doctor, if the doctor outlives you, has learned from what you have done to help the next generation patients. The cancer treatment today is a lot better than it was uh, 20 years ago. Why? Because they've learned out of that, those womb to tomb cycles and applied to the next womb, right? So that's cradle to cradle. We do that for our hardware. We absolutely can do it with this hardware because this is so much more in our control than this hardware is, right? This hardware, as I said, we have limited control over design and manufacture. We have some control. We have some neonatal uh, capabilities, right? And with genetic engineering, we are probably someday going to change the designs also of these hardware to some extent, right? We don't want to think about it, but it's within the realm of science. Uh, but even under the most futuristic, science fiction-y genetic engineering you can think of, we got infinitely more control over the design and manufacture and materials used here than we have over those systems. So we can be way more proactive over here. So if we can do personalized healthcare there, you better believe we can do personalized healthcare here. Okay. Again, volume makes a difference. Uh, if there are 20 million of these devices floating around, can I have a doctor on the shoulder of each and every one of them? You can. Hardware and software collects all that data. The doctor doesn't need to be physically examining this all the time. 
the data tells them, why do you think there are sensors in here talking to the cloud all the time? Uh, this can be monitored and people can tell you uh, whether your product is working well or not, okay? So thanks to IoT, it's within our realm of monitoring each and every device if need be. The reality is each and every device will probably not be, but the vast majority of them will be monitored or can be monitored, just as healthcare. Uh, yeah, we've got billions of people, billions and billions of people on this planet. Unfortunately, we're not monitoring each and every one of them with the level of health care they need. It's the same in the world of hardware. You'd like to monitor each and every one, but it's not affordable and uh, it's not always feasible. Yeah. Okay, and ending here with the chart that you guys are hopefully used to. So that's the uh, core knowledge set of the world of physics of failure. Be with you in one second. And then that is what we use in the design teams. That's what we use to design, uh, to come up with uh, ex uh, smart testing, meaningful testing. That's what we use to do real-time uh, health uh, monitoring and health management. And that's what the supply chain has to adhere to. So you have to manage your supply chain so they're not messing up your failure mechanisms and your design and your processes and your materials. And then, of course, at the end of the day or beginning of the day, uh, you've got to make sure you have a process that's not costing you too much money because all this takes money, right? All these activities, you've got to hire the right engineers, the right tools, the right uh, software for CAD tools, the right uh, testing hardware, uh, uh, right sensors, all of that costs money. Well, at the end of the day, are you making money or are you losing money because of all that? So, so that's the cost is cr crucial. Yeah. Oh, PHM, Prognostics and Health Management. Okay. Okay. Oh, this is not the last chart. Sorry, I lied. Uh, this chart I use to, uh, you guys really don't need it. Sometimes I get, uh, I do workshops for managers who are not really engineers or uh, uh, performing engineering functions. They did it maybe a long time ago. They're not doing it anymore. I use it mostly to remind them what are the activities that are needed in the physics of failure design. So Physics of failure process, physics of failure design. So if I go back to this chart, when I say detailed physics of failure based design, preliminary physics of failure design, what kind of modeling and simulations are involved over there? <coughs> Remember we said physics of failure means there are models for these failure mechanisms, but to use those models, I have to calculate the local stress. So there are two steps. One, I need to do how to do stress analysis. Two, I need to know how to run those, the failure model once stresses. So that's it, that's, there are just two steps. Here's the first step, stress analysis. I may want to know the thermal fields, the resulting mechanical fields, shock and vibration mechanical fields, moisture uh, absorption fields, and moisture-induced swelling, uh, diffusion, harsh chemicals and moisture diffusion through the product. I may want to know those fields. I may want to know all the electrical fields. And there are CAD tools available to do all of those. Okay? Sometimes tailored specifically for electronic <coughs> systems, sometimes general purpose CAD tools that you have to use. So many of the commercial FEA uh, houses, by the way, have now developed versions of the FEA just for electronic systems. So it's much easier to input designs of circuit cards, designs of chips, just take it from Mentor Graphics and input it into your FEA, and FEA does all the analysis, runs the failure models, and tells you where the risks are. So there are some commercial ho FEA houses that have uh, made tools like that. So it's two steps. First step is stress analysis, but just the stress alone doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't tell you when the part is going to fail. So you ha then have to input those stresses in your reliability models, the physics of failure models, and that tells you how much life margin you have. That means how long it's expected to fail, how long the customer <laughs> wants it to last. The difference is your life margin. The idea is to always have a life margin greater than one. And depending on how much factor of safety you want to use, it will be some value greater than one, right? So just like in every other engineering design, you apply a factor of safety. So for overstress, it's stress margin. For wear out mechanisms, it's life margin. Uh, rest of the chart I'm not going to really spend time on other than to say, you know, you can now do design trade-offs, optimize design optimization, you can rank your potential failure risks, you can design your accelerated stress tests, you can use these models to estimate remaining life in health, uh, health management, real-time health management, PHM, and so on. This one, I don't believe in it, okay? Reliability assessment, what does that mean? If any of you have been involved in the reliability world, the reliability statisticians want a number at the end of the day, which is probability of failure. And typically you're designing for 0.95 or 0.99, which is 99% probability of success. And people want to use design simulations to calculate the probability of success. 
that is very, very hard to do unless you know all the distributions, okay? And those are usually not that easy to determine. So while physics of failure does a very good job of allowing you to do proactive, robust design, if you, at the end of the day, if you want to actually come up with a reliability number, I think you have limited success with that, okay? You can certainly aim for good, robust factors of safety, but actually coming up with a number of when exactly it's gonna fail, what's the probability of survival is pretty hard. Mm -hmm. No, that's not true. So the reason I said you cannot, so you can, the person who designed the motherboard should have had access to CAD tools at that time to know how long the motherboard would survive. The parts that he or she is putting on the motherboard, the designer for those parts should have had access to CAD tools to know how long each one of those parts would survive so they can provide it to the motherboard designer. Okay, so it's a, that's why the supply chain is that important. Okay. So in a, in a properly design, we all know that in reality, you may be buying parts from a supplier who said, what, what's POF? <laughs> I don't understand what you're saying, right? Uh, but, but in a properly controlled supply chain, uh, you have reasonable estimates of uh, all of those. So, so yes, you can come up with an estimate, but it's just an estimate. You, the factors of uncertainty in those estimates and the statistical distribution, the factors of uncertainty in the statistical distribution are too high for you to say, I have 0.999 reliability in there. You just don't have that level of uh, certainty in your predictions, okay? Can you uh, mention the, the, uh, any of the, say, say like a relative chart of uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, say like I'm a, a manufacturer of a capacitor or a mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, give me any, any kind of relative chart of- Right, so what would you need from, uh, uh, capacitor supplier, right? You would want to know what tests they're running on it, what their failure distributions, viable distributions look like, and then you need to have in your CAD tools the ability to say, okay, they tested 8585, my product is gonna run at 3535, I need to know what their failure mechanisms are, so they should have run it to failure, given you the failure distributions, and given you some information about why did it fail? What was the failure mechanism? It, did it fail because of metal migration or did it fail because of opens? Uh, so you need to know the failure mechanism so that you can go back into your CAD tool and you say for this capacitor, I'm gonna capture that capacitor design in my CAD tool, right? B by capture the design, I mean the geometry, material properties and so on. I'm gonna apply the 8585 on it and then I'm gonna apply my 3535 on it and I'm gonna look at the factor of uh, acceleration factor for that mechanism, whichever they reported as the failure analysis. Uh, if the factor of, uh, if the acceleration factor is, I'll just throw a number out there, 12, okay? And there's failed in, uh, uh, after two months or six months, multiply that by 12, that's how long you would expect it to survive in your design. So you put that as that many months in your design. With some distribution, they've given you a viable loop. Then you do a block diagram of your design with those parts and with those distributions, and the computer cranks it and tells you, here's the final distribution of failure, uh, okay? Which means, if I go back to this curve for a second, what your tools will give you are these distributions, and then you would look at what the system will therefore look like, okay? Okay. <coughs> Okay, um, so these are some, I talked about tools. Uh, these are tools that we use actually in Cal. So these are internal tools that we have built up over time just to make our life easier. And some of our uh, sponsors also, are, uh, members of our consortium also use these. So it, there are uh, input interfaces so we can just uh, import the board design from Mentographics CAD tools, uh, which is basically the electrical eCAD tools. And then we'll, uh, uh, do the thermal analysis, we'll, uh, uh, we'll put in all the power dissipations, do the thermal analysis, put in the ambient as boundary conditions, cooling, uh, either conductive or convective cooling, and then we do mechanical vibration analysis, look at where the deflections and curvatures are highest, which components are at highest risk, we do moisture absorption analysis, do corrosion analysis, uh, so that's the stress analysis part. On the failure analysis part, we do uh, fatigue of vias, fatigue of solder joints, corro uh, corrosion of signal traces. So this is at the printed wiring board level, okay? 
Uh, then if you get down to the component level, there are similar tools that let you import the design of the component and then do again thermal analysis, mechanical analysis, corrosion and uh, electromigration, electrical analysis at the component level. And then, then again, you can predict time to failure as a function of stress level and see how different uh, failure mechanisms are competing. So those kinds of CAD tools are obviously necessary. If you, you can't do all these calculations by hand. The computer has to do all that. So you capture your design and give it to the computer. The computer already has the stress analysis and the failure models programmed in there. The CAD tool has those tools programmed in there. And they just run through all those tools, uh, all those mechanisms, and say which ones. Do a Pareto ranking of which are the, going to be the dominant ones for your design and your stress conditions. OK. Um, 11.30 is our coffee break, is that right, or is? Would you like to take a break now? Or uh, this is not a bad time to take a break. We'll figure out. Okay. If not, we'll continue on. I mean, the, 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 there's, there's still stuff we can cover. Ready? Oh, they're ready. ready. So let's take a break here. Yeah. the design verification test and the process verification test. And the role is very simple. You use those physics of failure models to design what, uh, to decide what's the acceleration factor. So uh, if my field condition is 35, 35 temperature humidity, and my testing is being done at 85, 85 temperature humidity, then what's the acceleration factor for different failure mechanisms for my design? It's, the answer is design specific, and the answer is uh, 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 mechanism specific. So not all mechanisms will accelerate by the same amount. And uh, uh, same mechanism by, will accelerate by different amounts in different designs. So you have to do the calculation when you're doing the design. We also do the calculation for our design. Uh, we do the calculation of what kind of acceleration factors do we need for accelerated testing. Uh, so that's accelerated stress testing. Remember those feedback loops to correct any problems that you see in testing. And then quality assurance tests, we've just talked quite a bit about it. So even after you're done with qualifying the initial design and the initial process, you have to keep repeating this on a batch-to-batch -batch basis. To uh, So different companies have different names for this ongoing testing, but that's fairly common to do routine quality assurance testing. In general, quality assurance testing will not be as detailed and as extensive as the initial verification testing, obviously. Because all you're looking for here is just variability. Here you're looking for the overall robustness of the whole design and process. Okay. Okay. Um, so if you think about it in terms of the bathtub curve, the, all the verification testing is addressing the nominal parts, that is the white distribution, and the purpose of quality assurance is to keep the red and the blue to a minimum. Try to limit variability variations as much as possible to reduce these failures. Okay. All right, um, the next few slides I don't think we're going to uh, hit right now. We don't have the time. So prognostics and health management, what are, uh, where all can physics of failure help? The word fusion means we are fusing uh, data analytic methods with physics of failure models. But I'll skip over these two slides for now. Okay? And increasingly, we are doing a lot of cloud-based uh, data acquisition, data analytics in order to do this kind of real-time PHM. Okay? basically using the cloud to monitor products that are out in the field. OK, uh, supply chain, we've talked about this chart also several times. I'll skip it, <coughs> except to remind you, and this is discussion we were having out in the corridor, and we had it just before we left here. And that has to do with the fact that when you're up at this level, you cannot do this accelerated testing and DV testing and PV testing for each and every individual part. You do it at the assembly level. But you cannot do it for each and every. How do you ensure that someone is giving you good capacitors or good uh, relays or good displays? Uh, you rely on your supply chain. The people who did those manufa manufactured those subparts, you rely on their test methods and their uh, 
uh, reliability verification methods for that. So the supply chain is very, very important. They have to give you their uh, uh, estimates of how robust their product is. Okay. In return, remember we discussed this, in return you have to tell them what your usage conditions are, otherwise they cannot decide whether their parts are good for your uh, environment unless you give them some idea of what your environment is. Okay, uh, we talked about cost. So talked about minimizing cost, how warranty and reliability costs run counter to each other. The more time you spend on making a robust part, the more money you spend on making a robust part, uh, the cheaper your warranty cost becomes, okay? And uh, there's a happy medium somewhere in between. That's where you try to always optimize your cost limits. The assumption there is you have the right warranty cost models and the reliability cost models. So that's also big research, uh, big part of our research is creating those tools and those models so uh, our sponsors can do these kinds of calculations. <coughs> this is just one chart which I skipped last time. I said that's kind of sales. I, I will go over it this time. This is a kind of a dated story. We can talk about it now because it's old. Uh, we have newer versions of the story which we're not allowed to talk about yet. So this is actually a slide that was made by one of our sponsors. You can guess who the sponsor is, just looking at the products, okay? Uh, <coughs> And uh, this was back in the time when this vehicle was still in the design stage, development stage. This was the previous generation vehicle, and this was the next generation that they were trying to use uh, physics of failure methods to develop, okay? Uh, they're, they're a sponsor of the CALS Center, okay? So uh, I actually showed you this product briefly in a previous slide when we were talking about stress analysis, and uh, maybe I'll go back quickly and show you which one that was. this product. So it's this particular product where you see the thermal analysis and the vibration analysis. So let's talk a little bit more about that product. Here it is. So it's, uh, it's what industry calls, uh, or automotive industry calls it a body control module. Okay. It controls all the uh, vehicle functions like cabin lights, door power locks, power mirrors, seats. Uh, unlocking your trunk, all of those kinds of operations, all those controllers are on this card. So what they did is they did the initial design. In the old days, they used to do, that's, that's the term they used to use, DBTF, which means you design the product, that means electrically design it, no mechanical design, right? They used to electrically design the product, uh, build hardware, go into the test lab, run some accelerated test as per some uh, generic spec, and if anything failed, go back and fix it, go back and test again and keep cycling back until they pass the tests. So one, there was no saying how relevant that test was for their environment because there was no acceleration factor calculation. Two, uh, took way too long to go through those iterations. So the vehicle development time back then for this generation was about uh, 30 months. They wanted to come down to 24 months, which was still way worse than some of their more aggressive competitors. Asian competitors like Toyota and all were already doing it uh, much faster. But at least as the next step, they wanted to get down to 24 months. So they were looking for various places in the product development, uh, auto vehicle development cycle where they could cut time. One of those was in this repetitive uh, cycling approach, uh, I mean cyclic uh, iterative testing and fixing approach they were using in the electronics. They wanted to, so every subsystem were given a budget. You're gonna cut this many weeks, you're gonna cut this many weeks, you're gonna cut this many weeks. So the electronics people uh, got their own budget and as part of their strategy, they decided to improve their design tools and do the mechanical design or the life cycle design as part of the, <coughs> along with the electrical design right up front and not try to test reliability into the product but design reliability into a product. Okay, so I'm stealing their buzzwords, test into a reliability into a product is just a term they use. Uh, so what we found in the initial design uh, was that two major issues. By and large, it was a pretty robust design, uh, simple enough circuit card, it's not that problematic. Uh, what the two major problems we found is one is these micro relays. Uh, these were, the initial design had very large, heavy relays, and you already saw the analysis, there was a big curvature right under that. The in vibration, it was, uh, that big mass was uh, deforming the circuit card a lot. 
So those were going to be at risk. So they actually changed and bought micro relays. From regular relays, they downsized to micro relays. It cost them a little bit more money, the micro relays, but that's what they opted to do as a design fix. The second problem they found was there are some high power FETs, uh, FETs, in this region, uh, all concentrated in the same reason because of the electrical design. So this part of the board was running very hot, way more than they wanted to allow uh, from a reliability point of view. So what they did is they uh, uh, put in a lot of, see that shiny metal over there? They put in a lot of thermal vias to conduct that heat away to one of the copper planes underneath. And that reduced the, their analysis said that reduced the heat quite a bit. So, uh, so there were several designs. Then they changed one of the connector designs, which was at risk because it was running too hot. So they moved to a different kind of connector. So they did several design fixes like that just based on their initial physics of failure simulations. And their uh, report of the outcome of all that was that in this generation, when they did the design test fix uh, approach, the fixing had revealed 16 what they call testing issues. Okay? That means these are issues that need to, you need to go back and fix, and the, a redesign, refix, and then test again. So they ran into 16 issues in this generation product that did not have physics of failure based design. In this generation, they found only six. And not all of those were, by the way, uh, physics of failure based. There were other issues mixed in there too. The, the actual physics of failure based hardware failures, they found very few in there. Some of these were software issues and so on. Bottom line, this is again their report, not ours. Uh, they managed to cut down. So this is the vehicle development program. This is the uh, 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 component development program for this one. So they were able to cut down the component development program from 130 weeks to 109 weeks. So that's a 21 week saving. That's huge in an automotive world, that's huge. So this is their estimate of how much time they save by using a proactive physics of failure based design. So it, it helps, it pays off, definitely. Okay, um, the, the, uh, well, I do want to point out, we, you cannot claim those entire 21 weeks just from the mechanical physics of failure uh, uh, design that they did. Some of it came from savings in other places, but it definitely helped contribute towards. Okay, uh, and this is the last slide, truly the last slide in this session. And this is just to uh, point out that a lot of what we're talking about today, the physics of failure approach, and how does that fit into the product development cycle, uh, those have been built into standards. Those have been archived into, documented and archived into IEEE standards. So if you look into these standards, there are more recent versions now. Uh, if you look into some of these standards, you'll find that a lot of what I'm talking about today has already been archived and documented in those standards. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to move right on to the next session. So let's talk about a s simple example of this kind of design for reliability. This was just uh, talking about uh, the approach. Let's, let's actually apply one of these models. So let's take a simple example where I can actually apply one of these models. And since my group works a lot at second level interconnects, I'm going to pick an example of solder joint failures and second level interconnects. Okay. Uh, so let's go to this one. So uh, I'm skipping for now the lead-free solder uh, se whole session. Uh, this session was very important about even uh, until five years ago when industry was transitioning from lead-free to tin lead. People were very uh, nervous about doing that. And uh, we had done years and years and years of testing and studies on that. So we were sharing these results with industry to try to build confidence. So there's a lot of that information is in this set of slides. Uh, you're welcome to look through it later on. If there's time at the end of the day, I'll come back to this, but my suspicion is we won't have time. I'll just flash this one slide up that I've shown you several times. Uh, you can see that we've been working on it since about 2000. Well, about 2003, 2004, that time frame to look at many different issues, uh, temperature cycling durability, vibration and mechanical cycling durability, building up models, the failure models for those. Uh, they're a little bit different from the model constants and the modeling approaches are a little bit different from tin lead solders. Whisker risk, all of the microstructural behavior. So we have spent a lot of time looking at all of that and looked at what are the other associated failures that lead free is causing on the rest of the system. Why? Because the temperatures are much higher. 
the kinds of chemicals we use in lead-free soldering are different, so it's causing a ripple effect and uh, failing other components. So uh, uh, we've also studied some of that. Uh, and you can see over the years we have captured all of that information in many different venues. And uh, uh, this, that's what this whole presentation talks about. So it's basically mostly the SAC family. I showed you this slide yesterday. Uh, some parts of the industry, especially semiconductor people, are using still mostly 405. Rest of the industry has moved either to 305 or 105, depending on consumer electronics is down here. High rail industries are up here. So various SAC family solders are what's being used, and that's the data that's in this presentation, the results of our studies on that. Again, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, put the, uh, defer this one until later if, if time allows. Okay, let's move on to a simple design example. So I'll go to this one. So we're going to talk about a model, simple model, just to give you a flavor of what do these models look like. I keep throwing all these names at you. Oh, yeah, we have a model for that. We have a model for that. What do they look like? Okay, and how do you use them? So I'll intentionally have picked the most mechanical example I can find because hopefully most of your mechanical engineers, you can relate to it very easily, okay? Cyclic fatigue. So we get a lot of cyclic fatigue in electronics. Uh, we get them in wiring harnesses. We get them in solder joints. We get them in wire bonds. I've been talking about this for the last three or four days. Uh, connectors. Uh, we get uh, die attaches. We get a lot of fatigue failures in many different sites. And then plated through holes and vias. All of those see fatigue failure. So can we look at a simple example, in this case I'll pick solder joint as an example, and look at some fatigue failures and how we model that. So let's go back to some basic fatigue concepts. Again, for mechanical engineers, this is trivial 101, but for the non-mechanical engineers, I just want to get you up to the same terminology I'm going to use. So think about a test, any test specimen, could be metal, could be uh, uh, any metal, that any material that is fatiguing, could be polymer, ceramic, but the point is, if you do cyclic, apply cyclic loads on that test specimen, eventually you will cause fatigue failures in the test region. So if you think about what the stress history looks like, you're cycling with time, so the stress history is varying with time. In response, and again for the non-mechanical engineers, when I say stress in that context, it is simply in, in that uniaxial context, stress is just the force divided by the area, right? That's the simplest. In reality, in electronics, it's much more complex. There are 3D stress states, 3D strain states. We do use computer models, finite element models to find those values. But for now, just for discussing concepts, the stress being plotted here is just the force divided by the cross-sectional area. And this is the corresponding strain history. So the strain is just a non-dimensional measure of the deformation, resulting deformation. So the deformation is non-dimensionalized the following way. So if this is the length of the specimen, initial length of the specimen, under these forces it's elongating by some delta L. So the net elongation is delta L. So delta L normalized by that initial L is a non-dimensional quantity. That is what we approximately call the strain. So once again, when you get to 3D, 2D, or 3D, it's a much more complicated definition. Uh, mechanical engineers already know those. Uh, let's keep today's discussion very simple. Uh, so this is the corresponding strain. So if this is uh, uh, not a creeping material, not a viscoelastic uh, or viscoplastic material, then the stress and strain will be in phase. But if there's creep in there, then you get a phase lag. Just as in electrical circuits, you get a phase lag when there's a damping in the system. The viscoplastic materials have built-in damping capabilities in them, so the stress and strain will be out of phase. Okay? Just as your current and voltage will be out of phase in a damped circuit. So uh, not necessarily out of phase, there'll be a phase lag between the stress and strain. Uh, but let's, for now, let's keep the discussion simple. Let's say this is not a creeping material, so it's not solder, it's not plastic, it's some metal like copper at room temperature, doesn't, there's no damping in this, no appreciable damping in this material at that temperature. So the stress and strain are almost in phase. And if you cross plot now the stress versus the strain, here's what you find. So we start, let's say, from zero. Initially, you find that the material is behaving elastically. That means stresses and strains are proportional to each other. They're linear. But then you reach the elastic limit or the yield strength of the material. The material starts to deform plastically. So plastically, it's A, it's nonlinear. 
B, it's not recoverable. It's a permanent deformation. That means when I unload, come back to zero force, this is stress versus strain, come back to zero force, I have this permanent deformation left in the specimen. The length has permanently changed and doesn't go back to zero. That's plastic strain, okay? Uh, now if I reverse the load, start compressing, right? Start compressing now, that's now I'm in the second half of the cycle, reversing the load. Uh, then I force it back into zero length, so when you cross that vertical line, it's back to zero length. And then because of the continuing compression, the length actually shortens. So it gets shorter, and then I, so notice that because of the plastic deformation, I didn't come back down along the loading line, I come back down along a different line. So now I reload, next cycle, reload, unload, reload, unload, and so on, okay? Not just unload, but load back in compression, and uh, keep repeating that cycle, keep repeating these cycles, I get this hysteresis loop, stress chain hysteresis. Uh, and hysteresis means the area inside this loop tells me how much work is being dissipated with each cycle, okay? How much energy is being dissipated. So uh, terminology, the cyclic range of stress, that means max stress to min stress, max stress to min stress is the range of cyclic stress, we call that delta sigma, and the range of cyclic strain is on the horizontal axis, that is the delta epsilon, okay? And this particular material, is a cyclically hardening material. That means you can see the first cycle hysteresis went up to this stress, next cycle went up a little higher stress, next cycle went up to a little higher stress. Slowly the material is hardening because of the cycling and uh, the hysteresis loop is getting taller and taller and taller, which means the delta sigma is changing cycle by cycle by cycle, <coughs> increasing. There are some materials that are the opposite. They will soften cycle by cycle by cycle. So this delta sigma will get, keep getting smaller. And then there's some materials where it'll stay almost the same. They cyclically neither harden nor soften. Okay. Okay. Um, so now we need a very simple designer's model. So what's really going on? What causes fatigue failure? So if I cycle this enough number of times, what do you think is going to happen? Think of a paper clip. If I stress it enough number of times, eventually it fractures, right? You start to grow some crack and then it eventually grows and it fractures. So that's a cyclic fatigue crack. What's really happening is complex stuff in the microstructure. Dislocations are moving back and forth. Grain boundaries are cracking. Some very complex stuff is happening, and people have built very complex dislocation mechanics-based model of all of those processes. But that's not what the designer needs. The designer says, give me a simple model where if I tell you how severe my loading is, that means what's my amplitude of strain, and what's my amplitude of stress, how many cycles will it survive? Just, just give me a simplest model that captures that information. So that's what we do. We go into a lab, we make specimen uh, test coupons of the material of interest, and we cycle them at various amplitudes, some tests with small stress, some tests with big stress, and we keep cycling them at that stress level until it fails. We create that, capture that data point, test at another stress level, capture that data point, and we just plot all that data. So that's what this data looks like. So I test at different stress levels and see how many on the horizontal axis cycles to failure, so I'll run some tests at that le stress level, some tests at this stress level, some tests at this stress level, and I'll put a, connect all the data with a smooth curve, and that becomes my fatigue curve for that material, okay? It's rather empirical, but it works great because no matter where I use that material, it'll follow that fatigue curve. As long as I can estimate what the stress is for that material in my design, I will be able to estimate how long that material will last in my design. Just to give you an example, I may test copper. I won't test at that length scale. Unfortunately, length scale matters because failures are the microstructure and your electronic structures are of the same length scale as your microstructure. They're down to tens of grains. They are very uh, fine. So my test coupon must capture that length scale effect. So normally we test much finer copper specimens if we're testing copper of the length scale of what your electronics have. But once we have done that and we've captured the SN curve, the copper in your electronics, no matter where you're using it, if it's the same copper alloy, is gonna follow exactly that fatigue curve. Okay, so if I can set up an equation to describe that curve, I have a fatigue model I can use for any electronic product for copper fatigue. But the same alloy of copper. You change the alloy, the fatigue properties change. Then you go back in the lab and measure the fatigue properties of that copper alloy. So if you open the ASM handbooks, American Society for Metals or ASTM handbooks, you find all those fatigue properties listed over there for most structural materials. Problem is 
mechanical engineers haven't spent as much time on materials used in electronic systems as they have in the mechanical world. So we don't have quite an exhaustive catalog of fatigue properties for materials used here. So in our labs, just, not just in Maryland, but all the universities that are doing research around the world in electronics uh, hardware, are spending the time cataloging these fatigue properties and all, and now they are available in design tools. Okay? Many of them are available in design tools. So all I need to do now is find, just fit, a, uh, cur fit an equation to that curve. Could be any equation as long as it describes that uh, behavior uh, and uh, is uh, written in terms of material constants, it's a fatigue model. It's a viable fatigue model. Okay? So here is the model that gets used a lot. So, uh, and uh, this is the so-called Coffin-Manson model. Okay? It's uh, the most commonly used model in uh, fatigue literature. So they modeled it the following way. They said, well, uh, up here, the stress levels and strain levels are very high. So we're talking about humongous hysteresis loops there, okay? Whereas down here, the stress levels are very small, so we're talking about tiny hysteresis loops there. So up here are big hysteresis loops, down here tiny hysteresis loops. And they observe that if you draw two asymptotic curves, then this one describes the behavior due to the plastic portion of the deformation here, and this one describes the behavior due to the elastic portion of the deformation. So any of these hysteresis loops, there's part of it is elastic deformation, part of it is plastic deformation. And if you look at those individual parts separately, the elastic deformations follow this straight line. The plastic deformation, the failure due to the damage due to plastic behavior follows that straight line. You add them up, you get this uh, uh, overall fatigue curve that you can actually measure in, the, in, the t in tests. So that's what they did over here. The, the, these plots, by the way, are on log-log scales. Okay? It cycles to failure, log scale. Uh, strain amplitude, log scale. And by strain amplitude, we mean this. We mean this. This is the delta epsilon is the strain amplitude. Okay, uh, so these two asymptotes are straight lines on a log-log scale. So straight line on a log scale is what kind of a mathematical function? Uh, that would be a semi-log, right? That would be if one of the axes was in log. This is a log-log. Both are on log scale. log A equals M plus C log B, okay? That is, sorry, that is a log A versus log B. If that's a straight line, either this way or that way, let's say the intercept is K, sorry, what did I use there? Yeah, K, and the slope is C, that's it, okay? So log A equals K intercept plus C. C happens to have a negative value there, but that's okay. C log B. That's the equation of a straight line. Well, now th that is if you take inverse logs over there, that is nothing but A uh, log inverse of sorry, uh, yeah, A uh, K times B to the C. Uh, this is actually log K. So k times b to the c. So this is not k. This is log of some value k. Okay? So it's this kind of an expression. So if I take log of this, this is log a equals log k plus c log b. Right? So straight line on a uh, log log scale is basically a power law. So that's what we have done over here. The red line, which is the uh, uh, damage from elastic strains, and we call that high cycle fatigue because elastic strains dominate uh, in the high cycle fatigue range, and the plastic strains are dominating in the low cycle fatigue range. So the blue curve is called low cycle fatigue, and the red cycle is called high cycle fatigue. So each one, because they're a straight line, can be described by a power law, okay, where the intercepts are, the, here's the intercept for the high cycle fatigue, and the slope is B, and the blue one, here's the intercept for the blue line, and here's the slope, C of the blue line. Now, so there are some model constants here. The sigma f prime over E and epsilon f prime and B and C. Four, well, if you, Young's modulus is also a, a constant, a material constant, but that's not a fatigue constant, that's just a stiffness. So there are four fatigue constants, sigma f prime, B, epsilon f prime, C. Four fatigue constants in order to describe that curve. 
uh, and all the experimental data lies on that curve. Okay? So it turns out that if you now extract, so by curve fitting you can extract those four constants, and once you have those constants, those are the fatigue constants for that material, and it doesn't matter where I use it, it'll, it can be modeled with those four fatigue constants. And that's what I meant when I said the failure mechanism has a model, it has model constants that are material properties. The only unknown here is epsilon A. I can do stress analysis of wherever my fatigue is. Let's say it's a solder joint failure. I do a modeling or measurement and find out epsilon A. I can now solve this equation for cycles to failure. So now I can predict for a given strain level, I can predict when that copper structure will fail, how many cycles. Okay? Of course, it's a nonlinear equation, but that can be solved very easily. Put it into MATLAB, out comes the solution. Okay? So any questions on this? The concept is critical. Okay? So once again, this is a physics of failure model. Why? Because the model constants are material properties. I don't have to build products to measure them. I can go into a lab and measure them. So the material constants are, uh, model constants are material properties. And the input is str uh, a, a stress of a certain kind. In this case, it's a cyclic strain amplitude. And the output is cycles to failure, NF. So it could be, for some models, it's time to failure. For some models, it's cycles to failure. And of course, if you know your cycle time, you can convert the cycles to failure to time to failure. So if you know in your product how many cycles per day are you accumulating, you can predict how many days the product will survive. Okay? So that is the basic fundamental concept of all physics of failure models. This is one example. Every physics of failure models this way, uh, works this way. We have a model. The model constants are only material properties. There's a place to input the stresses, which can be, in this case, mechanical strain. Sometimes it's temperature. Sometimes it's gradient of temperature. Sometimes it's uh, electrical field. Sometimes it's current density. Sometimes it's humidity or moisture. So somewhere you input the stresses. The output is either cycles to failure or time to failure. That's it. That's the pattern for all of those 20 failure mo uh, mechanism models I talked about today. Okay? So this is what we mean when we say, oh, we did physics of failure modeling. That's all we need. Nothing more sophisticated than that. Yes? Is it applicable to both ductile and brittle? Excellent question. If it's brittle, it'll be closer to this part of the curve. If it's ductile, it'll be closer to this part of the curve. Having said that, sometimes we prefer for, for brittle materials, we prefer to use fracture mechanics concepts rather than this kind of a continuum concept uh, where you're not modeling the explicit crack fatigue crack, sometimes we prefer to model the fatigue crack. That gets a little more complicated. In the interest of time, I have not done that. But again, there's extensive physics of failure literature. And if you look at our model library, if you look at the model library, fracture is very much in there. And it plays two roles. One is overstressed fracture, brittle fracture. We use fracture toughness concepts over there. Or once you've started a fatigue crack, to model the propagation of that crack, we use uh, fracture mechanics concepts over here. Again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to be able to cover all of that today. So usually what we do is we use, uh, we use this Coffin-Manson model to model the initiation, sorry, Coffin-Manson model to model the initiation of a crack and then in a brittle material, and then we'll use uh, fracture mechanics, Paris law, to model the cyclic propagation of that crack. Okay, uh, so the next step is, in order to use that model, I have to estimate what that cyclic strain amplitude is for a given, uh, 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 given design scenario, right? So that's where we already talked in, in simple uh, qualitative terms, we've talked about the fact that, look, you're getting a lot of straining, deformation, and hence strains in solder joints uh, due to a variety of reasons. There's in-plane CT mismatch shear, uh, there is local versus global CT mismatch. So we talked about these two diagonals being seeing higher strain than these two diagonals because of the superposition of local and global mismatch. Then vibration causes and thermal warpage causes this kind of deformation. That causes strains in solder joints. So our task is to estimate what those strains are or what these strains are, input them into the fatigue model, and it tells us how many hours of vibration can I withstand or how many temperature cycles can I withstand. We can make those calculations. So the vibration one, it's hard to do closed form calculations. We usually tend to do them numerically with computer models. So depending on where in your circuit card the component is sitting, 
it'll have a different time to failure. Give you a simple example. Go back to our uh, GM slide, okay? Oops. Go back to this slide. Okay, so look at that product. So I'll go back and show you the picture of that product here. So clearly in this product, components that are located, sorry, are located in this part of the region are seeing a lot of curvature. So their leads and solder joints are going to see a lot of deformation. So components sitting here will fail relatively fast. So uh, less number of R's to failure here than components that are sitting here. There's not much distortion of the uh, circuit card here, therefore not much distortion of the jo solder joints and leads over here. So components here are not at risk. The ones here are at risk. So we wanted to minimize that deformation. That's why the uh, manufacturer in this case switched to very light micro relays from regular relays. Okay? So that's how you mitigate these risks. So we did calculations of some of the components that are sitting there, saw how many years of life they have, turned out to be less than what the manufacturer wanted. In this case, they wanted seven years life minimum. That's why they had to change their relays and go to lighter relays to reduce that amount of deformation there. Okay? So that's exactly how physics of failure models work. Oh, sorry. Okay. Same thing with thermal cycling. If we find that this is not going to survive seven years of temperature cycling, then we put underfill under it or try to match the CTs a little bit better. So may, we may put some kind of a uh, glue, a core of some kind to reduce the CT of the board. So glue a ceramic plate or something to reduce the CT of the core to match the CTs better. Or we'll try to limit the range of the temperature cycle so we don't have such a big hysteresis loop for in the mechanical loading, so on. So a variety of techniques to try to mitigate those risks. But, uh, but how do we do that calculation, right? So using that Coffin-Manson model, let's go through a simple example where we can estimate the strain level for this kind of a configuration. But I'll further simplify the problem. I'll assume in this very simple example that the local CT mismatch is negligible. It's being dominated by global CT mismatch. Okay? And that's not a bad assumption if this is copper metallization. If it's LI42 metallization, you cannot make that assumption. But for copper, the local CT mismatch is not very high. So we can make that approximate approximation. Okay? And then in the real world, of course, sometimes it's thermal cycling and vibration all happening together, like electronics under the hood of your automobile, seeing vibration and temperature cycling together. There you have to consider both damages, add up all the damage, and see how many years of life they have. So things can get more complicated. But for illustration purposes, I'll take a very simple example. Just thermal cycling and just global mismatch. The goal is to try to calculate the strain range, calculate the strain range so I can put it into the coffin medicine model for SAR. OK, so here's, uh, uh, this just uh, shows global and local CT mismatches. We can skip over that. It just shows, uh, uh, so for example, in flip chip, you can see how severe this can be. Uh, so this is, chip is 3.5, so that's been put on a ceramic substrate in order to match the thermal expansion coefficients. So these flip chip joints are not really going to be at much risk. But the printed circuit card is much higher CT compared to ceramic, which is only 8. And uh, printed circuit card is 18 to 25. So now these solder joints are going to see a lot of uh, mis uh, mismatch of strain. Okay? So uh, we've discussed all of this. We'll skip that. Actually, let me do the simple model, then I'll come back to all of these slides here. Let's start here, and I'll come back to the other slides in a minute, the ones I skipped. So let's start that cycling over here. Let's say I've got solder joints under, and take a simple case, let's say it's flip chip. I've got a substrate over here, so silicon over here, okay? Uh, and there are multiple solder joints. Let's just consider the corner. The, let's say this is the outermost solder joint so at some distance L from the center. So let's think about what's happening to this solder joint. So I start out as I heat, the PWB will heat more than the printed circuit card. So the solder joints will start to shear. Okay? So the shear stress and the shear strain, this is the shear strain on the, on the vertical, sorry. Uh, shear strain on the horizontal. Okay? So shear stress versus shear strain, this is the hysteresis. Exactly as we were drawing the hysteresis here, okay, we were cross-plotting stress versus strain. That's what I'm doing here. 
I'm plotting stress versus strain. So, and I've simplified the solder material model. I've simply said it's elastic up to the yield strength. And once it yields, it goes out completely flat. That means it's perfectly plastic beyond that. So with no further stress, the solder continues to deform. And it'll continue to deform until the mismatch of strains are completed between these two, right? So you heat up by delta two. This one is expanding less than this. So the solder has to deform by this amount in order to make up that difference. And then when you cool it, it unloads, then loads in the reverse direction, yields again in, in the opposite shear, and comes here, and then keeps cycling back. So let's look at that briefly. So I'm gonna start heating from here. Okay, so I start heating from here. It went up to the elastic limit, yielded, and ended up there at the end of that heating cycle. Then I cooled it, it unloaded. Here's a permanent plastic de shear deformation. Okay, uh, and then I went from here to the cold end, it went all the way to the end, uh, uh, yielded again, and went to this end. And then when I unloaded back, it came back here. Okay, so here's the hysteresis. So the cyclic amplitude of that hysteresis is this delta gamma, okay? This is the delta gamma that acts like, that I have to use in my <coughs> fatigue model. So that's the cyclic strain range in the solder, and that's what I'm gonna use as for cyclic strain in this model. Question is, do I have these properties for solder? And the answer is yes. A lot of people have done enough experiments to estimate these constants, but now life is gonna get a little more complicated. Solder is, has damping in it. Solder is a viscoplastic material. It's not elastic plastic. It's a viscoplastic material. That means it has some damping in it. That makes this model a little bit more complex. The good news is people know how to model damped, uh, cyclic fatigue and damping materials or viscoplastic materials. Remember I told you there's a high temperature industry making high temperature super alloys for combustion chambers and uh, high temperature applications, nuclear combustion chambers, et cetera. They already taught us how to do fatigue calculations for high temperature applications. We're going to steal their idea and just use it here, okay? Okay, so, so let's go back and do that. So first off, I've got this delta gamma but I cannot use just a simple, put that into Coffin-Manson model as is, I have to use a slightly different version of Coffin-Manson because solder creeps. Okay, so let's talk about that creep a little bit. Let's talk about what solder is and what it's doing. So let's start over here. And let's just talk about tin lead solder. SAC follows similar arguments, but at a higher temperature. For tin lead solder, at very low temperatures, it's a very brittle crystalline material. It's like all metals at low temperature, it's very brittle. As you start to raise the temperature, it starts to get ductile, okay? So you were asking about ductile brittle transitions and so on. Uh, so the same material, same solder at higher temperature, what was uh, acting brittle at low temperature at a higher temperature is now has some ductility, okay? Which means if I were to draw the stress strain curves, at a very low temperature, solder would act like this, stress versus strain, very elastic, brittle, it'll fail over here. At a higher temperature, same material will act like this. It'll yield at some stress, and then it has a lot of ductility. That means it can deform a lot before it fails. This is deformation, normalized deformation. This is the, oh my goodness. Yep, thank you. Down here, please. <laughs> okay, so at low temperature, let's say I've used minus 65 over here, that's what solder does. Linear elastic all the way to failure, brittle failure. At room temperature, that same stress strain test will produce a stress strain curve like this. That means it yields over here at a yield strength, and then a lot of plastic deformation and uh, by plastic deformation, I mean if I unload, there'll be this permanent deformation. So this part is elastic deformation at this point, and this part is plastic deformation at that point, okay? But the point is that after a certain amount of deformation, it'll fail, it'll fracture. But you can see there's a lot of ductility. It can deform a lot plastically before it'll fail. As you get to even higher temperatures and keep loading at that same loading rate, it starts to do that. 
Why is the stress coming down? Because of the creep deformation. Because the creep, it's stress relaxing. Even as you're loading, it's continuing to stress relax, and the relaxation is outstripping the rate at which you're building up more load. Okay? So it's stress relaxing, and it fails like this. So this is happening at 100, uh, 100 to 125, uh, 100 degrees C and beyond. So at greater than 100 degrees C, this is what it's doing. Well, even at lower temperatures, if I loaded it l s slow enough, I would see that kind of relaxation. Okay? But if I load it very fast, then you're not going to be able to see that stress relaxation. So which goes back to the question that uh, was asked on Professor Ramanujam on the first day, which is the right stress strain curve? There's, that depends on what's your loading rate, what's your temperature, what is the material. Everything drives that answer of what, is, what will the effect of stress strain curve look like. Okay, okay so this, in other words, the solder is ch changing its behavior a lot from brittle to ductile elastic plastic to viscoplastic, that means it can now un, uh, experience creep deformation. And simultaneously, the microstructure also evolved. As you cy keep cycling, the microstructure keeps evolving. So solder is a nasty material. And by uh, evolving, what I mean is the grain structure changes. So what the solder was in day one of the, when the electronics was made is going to be very different from what it's going to be one year later, two years later, five years later. The solder is going to look entirely different because the microstructure has evolved and its effective properties will have evolved. Okay, so it's a complicated story. Okay, so here is what elastic plastic ductal deformation looks like. So we use a power law relationship between stress on the vertical axis and strain on the horizontal axis. The elastic portion is just linearly proportional. Stress, is linea uh, str stress and strain are linearly proportional. Uh, constant is Young's modulus. And, uh, this is a power law relationship between strain and stress when it comes to plastic deformation. And then you get creep deformation. So one way that we measure creep deformations in the lab, the standard method is that you apply a constant force. Okay, so you take a specimen, you apply a constant force, and then you hold the force. That means maybe you hang a dead weight or something. And then it continues to deform on its own under that constant force, and you measure that deformation rate. That's directly creep deformation. Okay. So that's what's happening here. Apply a constant force. So there's an initial deformation because of that force. And then as I keep the force there, this, that's the strain axis. This is time. The strains continue to increase, and, uh, and not even uh, linearly with time. So part of the time, it's nonlinear. Part of the time, it's linear with respect to time. And then it becomes nonlinear again, and then ultimately fails. Usually, most of our, for most of our design, we design for this linear region. We never let this material go into that nonlinear region. Okay, so if you look at this linear region, the slope of that, which would be epsilon dot, this is strain versus time. So the strain rate for this linear region has a dependence on stress, a power law dependence on stress, and an exponential dependence on the inverse of temperature. Uh, you can barely see that. Let me zoom in. So the strain rate, that is the slope of that linear portion, has a power law dependence on stress and an exponential dependence, we, that form is called Arrhenius, by the way. That's activation energy, that's the universal gas constant, and that's temperature. So this is 1 over T, so it has an exponential dependence on the inverse of temperature. Crucial, the temperature must be in Kelvin, not in degree C, in Kelvin. Okay. Okay. All right, so that is what solder, how solder behaves. It has elastic deformations, it has plastic deformations, and it has creep deformation. So as the temperature goes up, or the stresses go up, the creep deformations get larger and larger, and they start to dominate. So, and notice that it's a, the factor of time is in there, epsilon dot, so that's why the loading rate is important. The stress strain curves will change based on the loading rate, because there's time involved in that equation. That's epsilon dot. Okay. Uh, not much unlike if you have an inductor and capacitor in your circuit, uh, at what rate you're building up the voltage will affect the circuit behavior, right? So these are the solution will be rate sensitive. Okay, and then I talked about microstructural evolution. That also is something we have to deal with. So here's a micro, initial microstructure. The day after you finish soldering, tin lead solder will look like this. There's dark gray and light gray regions. The dark gray regions are tin. The light gray regions are, sorry, dark gray regions are, uh, uh, tin and light gray regions are lead, okay? And uh, then this is what SAC looks like. Totally different microstructure. This is 
predominantly tin, mind you, because SAC is 97% tin, okay? So this is mostly tin, buried in here intermetallics of silver, copper, and tin copper, uh, of silver tin and copper tin, but you cannot see those. Those are so tiny at this length scale, you cannot see them. You have to zoom in a lot more to see those. But you can see the grain structure here. You can see, so these different grays, each one is a different grain. So that's a full BGA joint. So they're barely less than 10 grains in that entire joint. So that's why life gets complicated because tin is highly anisotropic. That means depending on which direction of the tin crystal you're measuring, you get totally different stiffness values and totally different CTEs, okay? Which means this grain doesn't behave like this grain. This grain doesn't behave like this grain. They have different properties in the global loading direction. So the actual stress strain behavior of the whole solder joint is gonna be some kind of a mix of all of those. Goes back to Professor Ramanujam's question. He said when you have a, so this is like a composite material. It's like you've got six different materials because the tin has totally different properties in each of those six grains uh, along the specimen direction. So when you have a composite material like that, what do you call a stress strain curve? Because each grain is contributing a different stress strain curve to the overall structure. So life gets complicated, okay? So we usually take some kind of an average volume, uh, volume averaged value. So the next question is, the microstructure is not gonna stay like this. As you temperature cycle, it's gonna evolve. So this is actually after it's failed, but if you look at the portion that has not failed, you can see that it's coarsened a lot. So this is what the phase, do. these are the two phases, tin and lead. This is what the phases look like uh, at some point of the temperature cycling. And this is what it looked like close to failure. It coarsened a lot, so there was a lot of coarsening of the phases. And then eventually you got fatigue failures in that coarsened phase, okay? And the failures uh, initiated grain boundaries and travel sometimes through the grain, sometimes through the boundary, along the boundary. This guy, you get recrystallization. So when you temperature cycle, those big grains recrystallize into much smaller grains. So wherever the stress concentrations were, that you got more recrystallization. Wherever there was less stresses, you got less recrystallization. But you can see that there's some recrystallization. Those big grains have now become many, a few big grains have become many small grains. And failure usually happens along those grain boundaries and sometimes through them. So there are different microstructural evolutions in different solders, so you have to be careful about those. Okay, um, and then here's, so let, if you take tin lead for now, here's how damage occurs. It slowly, uh, uh, you start to grow micro cracks at grain boundaries, they start to join up, and then eventually they become larger and larger cavities and cracks at the triple corners of uh, grains, and then eventually those cracks and voids join up and you've got a macro crack going through the whole thing. Meanwhile, the microstructure is also coarsening, which you can see. So the fine phase structure has now evolved into a very coarse phase structure. Okay, did you, did you have a question? No, okay. All right, <clears throat> so the solder is progressively, we say that the terminology we use is that the solder is progressively damaging and we use some kind of a damage index to monitor that and then when the damage index reaches one, the solder fails, okay, or it's considered to have failed. Okay, so these are, these uh, damage at the grain boundaries is happening partially because of just mechanical stress that's accumulating there. That's the plasticity, uh, plastic strain. And then the creep strains are actually causing little micro voids. So some of these are cracks, some of these are voids, micro voids at the grain boundaries. So there are two kinds of damage going on. So there's a Damage due to plastic strains, dislocations are causing cracks, and there's a damage due to the creep deformation, those are the voids forming at the uh, triple corners of the grain boundaries. And then they all join up eventually, and so there's an interaction between them. So the term used for that is creep fatigue interaction damage, okay? So that's what you have to account for in high, uh, high, uh, high temperature fatigue damage, cyclic <coughs> fatigue. People do that in, uh, as I said, in the nuclear industry, in the aerospace industry, for other high temperature super alloys we have to do that for solders. So there are several ways of doing that. We'll talk about one or two methods. I'll skip over this one. This talks about all the voids that are forming and cracks that are forming. Talks about the details of that. I'll skip over this. There's also damage sometimes in the intermetallic layer. So if you zoom into the intermetallic layer that's between the base metal and the solder, this is what it looks like. Remember I told you that they look very scalloped? Then after a lot of aging, it'll thicken and the amount of scalloping will decrease, but the intermetallic is still there. And sometimes our failures are at the interface between the solder and the intermetallic. 
sometimes in the intermetallic itself and sometimes in the bulk solder. So what failure model you're using has to be, uh, ha you have to use the correct one. So if all your failures are in the intermetallic, you cannot use fatigue models for bulk solder. Okay. So we do worry about that. So when we do drop uh, modeling drop fatigue, we tend to use models that are meant for the intermetallic. When we do thermal cycling fatigue of solder, we mo use models that are meant for uh, bulk solder fatigue. Okay. The example I'll give you now is for bulk solder fatigue. Okay. So, and you can see here how sometimes the, the intermetallic layer just unzips. This is in drop loading, by the way. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have been through these. Skip over these. Okay. So here's here's the simplest model example of simplest model that is out in the literature. This is out of an IPC standard. Okay. Uh, that's the Institute for Interconnecting Circuitry. Okay. By uh, packaging and interconnecting circuits. So. Uh, this is the model they've put out there in their standards. And the original author for that was Werner Engelmeyer, pretty famous name in the world of solder fatigue. And he said, let's do some very simple calculations. OK, keep the model simple. So this is the same uh, leadless uh, package or flip chip that we were talking about. So this can be a uh, flip, chip, uh, ceramic, uh, flip chip silicon chip. Or this could be just a ceramic package, leadless ceramic package. Bottom line, there's no leads. This directly sit on a solder joint. Okay? So think about what happens when it expands. If this length of the package is L sub D, then uh, it expands. And the mismatch, we did this calculation on paper a few days back. The mismatch between them is L delta alpha is the CT mismatch. Delta T is the temperature excursion. Okay? And divided by two because half is on this side, half the mismatch is on this side, half the mismatch is on this side. And LD is the total length. If you were to take half the length, LD over two, then that would also explain this equation. So that's the mismatch in the deformation. And the solder is straining in shear mode in order to make up that deformation. And to find the shear strain, you just have to divide by that H. That gives you that angle. Okay. So it's this. Let's zoom in there. Oops, sorry. So this is the mismatch in the deformation. And divided by h, which is the height, gives you that angle. And that angle is defined as the shear strain. So LD delta alpha delta t over 2 divided by h gives you an, a very crude estimate of what the shear strain is. OK? Yes? OK. All right. So that is the, so if you look at the hysteresis loop for that solder, it basically follows very crudely, it follows this. So there's initially there's elastic and plastic deformation. We are modeling it as perfectly plastic. That means after it yields, it just goes across straight. And then because of the temperature, it stress relaxes, okay, height, because this is all happening due to temperature cycling. By the time you're at the top of the cycle, but by the time you're at the top of the cycle, it's creeping a lot. Remember, creep is uh, temperature sensitive. So all those stresses relax away. And this is the final shear strain. And that shear strain amplitude is this value. Okay? Uh, that's the shear strain the solder has to go through in order to make up that expansion mismatch. So now you have the delta gamma. We can go back and try to put it into our Coffin-Manson model here. Oops. Here. But the problem is that because of the creep deformation, it's sensitive to the loading rate. So if I temperature cycle very fast, I get one, uh, one answer for number of cycles to failure. If I temperature cycle very slowly, I get more creep deformation per cycle. Than I, and we saw that creep deformation causes different kind of damage than plastic deformation. So now I get a different number of uh, cycles to failure. So I have to somehow adjust my model, calibrate my model, to put in the loading rate into the, uh, into the picture. Okay? So, and temperature. So if I go up to very high temperature, I get more creep. It, it has a certain number of cycles to failure. On the other hand, if I'm cycling at a very low temperature, mean temperature, I'm not getting a lot of creep. I get higher number of cycles to failure. So somehow I have to account for what temperature range I'm getting. So mean of the temperature cycle. And what I mean by that is if I have these two temperature cycles, one of them is at this mean, okay, one of them is at this mean, although my delta temperature may be the same, 
therefore delta gamma may be the same, but the T mean is very different. So T mean is very different here and here. So this is a cold temperature cycling. This will last much longer because at cold temperature I don't have a lot of creep. This has a higher temperature, this will creep a lot more. This won't last as long. Although my delta T is the same, this won't last as long. It'll fatigue much faster because it has more creep strain. So somehow I have to calibrate, if I look at my Coffin-Manson model, it doesn't take either of those into consideration. It just takes the delta strain, which is just a function of delta T, and it has model constant. The, the rate of loading, the frequency of loading is not in the picture, and the mean temperature is not in the picture. I have to find some way to put those into this model. And that's what Engelmeyer did. And he did it kind of quasi-empirically. He ran a lot, he didn't run a lot of tests. He took a lot of tests from Roger Wilde and IBM, and uh, who had run a lot of tests at different mean temperatures, different frequencies, and so on. And he, uh, Engelmeyer, basically fit his simple model to those, to that data. So that allowed him to correct it. So he said, if I go back to my fatigue model, so I'm going to have to rewrite the fatigue model. So he did two things. First, he said, so remember our fatigue model. I'm going to write it here again, delta epsilon divided by 2. Here's my Coffin-Manson model. First, the low cycle, uh, high cycle fatigue term, which is sigma f divided by e to nf raised to the power b. That is the high cycle fatigue part of the curve. Then I add in the low cycle fatigue part of the curve, which is plus epsilon f prime. This is sigma f prime divided by e. This is cycles to failure. And all my fatigue data usually is on around that curve. Okay. So plus sigma, uh, sorry, epsilon f prime, that's this guy, 2nf to the power of c, where c is this slope, b is this slope, okay? First thing he said is, well, solder sees such large temperature cycles, uh, such large strains in temperature cycle that we are usually in the low cycle fatigue range. I'm just going to ignore that term. That makes my life simpler, okay? So he just doesn't consider that term. He just considers one power law term. Then he says, if I do that, then, uh, and this is, of course, shear strain. So this is what we calculated as delta gamma, OK? So this is the plastic portion of the strain, because up here, it's mostly plastic strain. So if I write that as delta gamma divided by 2 <coughs> equals some material constant 2nf to the power c, I can invert this equation and solve for nf. So nf will become uh, delta gamma p, delta gamma p divided by 2 divided by epsilon f prime, take that to the other side, raise that quantity to 1 over c, and then divide by 2. Did everyone follow that? So all I did is I solved for nf out of this equation. So first I took the epsilon f prime to the other side, then I raised the entire thing to 1 over c, then I divided by that 2, and that gives me an expression for nf. That's what he started to use. So that's that expression. If you go back to the slide, sorry. Let's go back to the slide. Yeah. OK, so that's that same expression. Half delta gamma divided by 2 epsilon f to the power 1 over c. And then he added some statistics, because the reality is they're not all going to fail at that one cycle to failure. There'll be some distribution around it. So he put a Weibull distribution around it. This is the Weibull slope. And uh, so if you want to find probability of, let's say, 1% failure, you would put in 0.1, uh, uh, yeah, 0.1 for x and solve this equation to find a uh, number of cycles to 1% failure. Okay? Now let's look at how he modified this to take into account mean temperature and frequency. So he does both of those in this exponent c. He, he corrects that exponent or calibrates that exponent c by making it a function of temperature, mean temperature. So this is the mean of the temperature cycle. And this is the time taken for each cycle. Not the entire cycle. He just considered the dwell time. So if, if I go back here again and put up this temperature cycle that we used, He said that most of the creep happens while it's dwelling, okay, while it's dwelling. So he adds up that and that and calls that dwell time. Okay. Now, 
Granted, there's more creep going on during the hot dwell than during the cold dwell, but he basically uh, adds them bo both up equally. Okay? And so he has the mean temperature. This is what he's calling TSJ. Okay? That mean temperature is TSJ and the dwell time. The dwell time is an indirect measure or a proxy for the loading frequency or loading rate. Okay? So both of those are taken into account, the mean temperature and the loading rate are both taken into account in his model, sorry, over here. So mean temperature and the loading rate. How did he come up with that complicated expression? That's a long story. We are going to skip that in the interest of time. But he basically took a lot of data, fatigue data, like I said, that IBM had already generated at different temperatures, different loading rates, and so on. And he fit this correction, this calibration to the coffin manson model uh, using this kind of an expression. So this model, because it's so easy to use, everything is closed form, has gained a lot of popularity. It's approximate. It doesn't give you very accurate answers, but it gets in the right ballpark, so much so that it has been enshrined in industry standards. Okay, So it's an IPC 9701. I want to caution you, though, like all simple models, it has a lot of approximations, and it's partially accurate. It works reasonably well for some geometries and not so well for some other geometries. So before you start using it, you have to read the caveats that are given in the IPC standards for when it works better, when it works, when it doesn't work very well. Okay? So when it doesn't work very well, you have to go to more detailed stress analysis and get a better estimate of what that cyclic strain is. And then there are other approaches for doing this correction for temperature and creep. For example, in my group, we uh, use a slightly different approach to correct for temperature and creep. And uh, we are not going to be talking about that right quite yet. If there's time, I'll tell you how we do it. it uh, it's a little bit different. And our method is not brand new either. I didn't invent any method. I just looked at the high temperature industry, and I saw some of them. So if you look at the nuclear industry and the aerospace industry that have to design for high temperature structures, some of them use a similar approach. They call it the frequency adjusted fatigue exponent. They calibrate the fatigue exponents. Uh, to based on empirical data. Some of them use a different approach called strain partitioning. There they actually look at the strain range and they say, well, some of it is creep, some of it is plasticity, some of it is elastic. And they actually estimate what portion is creep, what portion is plastic. So my group uses that approach. We use the partitioning approach. OK. okay. And then uh, so basically what we do is we collect a lot of data, run tests. Just, so just like IBM had done, and Engelmeyer had calibrated his models for tin lead solders. So his expo uh, uh, constants, epsilon f, and these values, 0.442, uh, so 0 0.325, 0 0.442, 0 0.006, 174, these constants were all derived for tin lead solder based on IBM data. We went back, and not in my group, but a different group in CALS has gone back and recalibrated those constants for other solders, different, sa different kinds of SAC solders. So we ran a whole bunch of, so what IBM did, we repeated, ran a whole bunch of tests, cycles to failure, different mean temperature, different dwell times, different uh, 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 cycle times, that means loading frequencies for many different solders, as you can see, and collected the data and fit the models. So what we have within the CALT software are similar models. So you can see, ran a huge number of test matrices, different loading profiles, different materials, different package types. And we didn't do it alone. We were part of other consortia, the NEMI, INEMI consortium, and uh, part of that. And we completed these, helped them complete these studies and generated fatigue constants. Okay? So you can see the fatigue constants that are generated for. So this is uh, C at one particular temperature and frequency. Similarly, we have Cs at different temperatures and frequencies. The details are not given here. Okay? Okay. And then the package style makes a difference. Remember, some of these packages are uh, flip chips. Some of these are not. Some of these, in fact, are pretty flexible. And that makes a difference because this warpage relaxes some of the stresses. And then what happens is the delta gamma epsilon, uh, the delta gamma estimate that we made with that simple equation is no longer accurate enough. You have to calibrate that. And we've done that too. Sometimes those calibration factors can be quite huge. So it would be that delta alpha, delta L, uh, 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 delta T, delta uh, uh, alpha times L over here, but then you have to adjust it by that uh, 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 relaxation factor, and sometimes that can be huge. There's 80% uh, relaxation because of the uh, warpage, 
and then the actual strain is much, much smaller, only 20% as large as Engelmar's original equation. Okay? So when you have flexible components like that, you have to be careful. So if you don't account for that, your data is going to be far away from the fatigue line. It, once you take that, put that calibration factor in, the data follows the fatigue line. How did we come up with that calibration factor? By two methods. One is we did finite element modeling to find out uh, how much lower the stresses are from that simple equation that we were using. The other is Professor Hahn actually did experiments, did more interferometry and measured the actual strains and found there were only 20% of what was predicted by that simple Engelmeyer equation. So that's how we come up with those calibration factors. Okay, uh, let's move on. So, uh, here's another approach. Interest of time, we're not going to be able to do that. It's, uh, we're breaking at 1 o'clock, right, for lunch. Okay, so we have a little bit of time. This is a so-called Norris-Landsberg model. I won't spend a lot of time, but just point out that he takes a different, mo they take a different approach. Uh, this is, uh, these guys were at IBM. They took a different approach, same data set, but they fit a different model than Engelmeyer to it. That, uh, they basically said the cycles to failure have an exponential dependence on temperature as opposed to Engelmeyer put in his temperature here, okay? Engelmeyer put in his mean temperature into that expression with this form, okay? These guys did it differently. They said that dependence on temperature follows an erroneous kind of relationship. And they, the, lo uh, the loading frequency, Engelmeyer put it, that in as a correction for dwell time in the exponent. They said, no, we're not gonna, we're gonna keep the exponent a constant. We're gonna put in the loading frequency that is inverse of the cycle time. Loading frequency as a separate term with some uh, calibration constant uh, exponent m, okay, which they treat that as a material property. So in the, the Norris-Landsberg model, C2, m, alpha, and q are material properties. So one, sorry, one, two, three, and four. So just like Engelmeyer had four uh, uh, calibration constants, material properties, material constants, so do these guys, but it's a very different approach. So some companies, and remember, I cautioned you, you call the experts in, they'll give you multiple answers, and then you have to decide what to do at the end of the day. So a lot of design groups that I know make both predictions. They do an IPC, which is Engelmeyer prediction, and then, then they do a Norris-Landsberg prediction. They take the worst of the two and design to that. Okay, do a worst case design, or conservative design. Okay. Um, the next part, so these are very simple, all closed form, the strain calculations are very, very simplified, okay, closed form models. So sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes you have a complex state of stress and then you have to do a more detailed calculation like I showed you here. The FBGAs were nowhere close to the simple strain calculation. They're off by 80%, okay? So th in cases like that, we have to use numerical, more detailed finite element simulations. Cannot use that simple calculation. We do more detailed simulations to try to see what's going on, and that's to account for complex material properties, complex geometries, th that gives you complex uh, 3D stress states. So we do these complex models, look at the solder joints, find out the strains in the solder joint. Uh, that's how we find out the delta epsilon, delta epsilon from those kinds of models, and then use the fatigue model to predict failure, okay? Okay, um, so what we do is we, uh, in the finite element model, we'll build up a model of the geometry, we'll model the material properties, model all the creep properties, uh, uh, apply the temperature uh, uh, history to that model, computer model, and then out comes a hysteresis prediction at the, in the solder joint, and then we'll use that hysteresis and take the strain range out of that. That's got all these complexities, warpage, creep deformation, loading rate effects, all of that has been included because of the constitutive model in the detailed finite element. So this is much closer to the true hysteresis loop, unlike the simple approximations that Engelmeyer made. Okay, it, here. Unlike the simple approximation that Engelmeyer made. So this is much closer to the true approximation. And then you can take the strain range out of here and predict failure. So some people use the strain range. Some people use the energy that is being dissipated per cycle. That's the area inside that hysteresis loop. Uh, in my group, we prefer the energy-based method, okay? And then, we, we, depending on whichever one you're using, you have a fatigue curve, which is a material property again. So uh, 
in here is the either the cyclic strain range or the energy of that cycle, okay? And A and B are material properties. You predict cycles to fail. Okay, uh, and there again, there are many different models. Manson Coffin model, then other people use an integrated matrix creep model. I use, uh, in my group, we use uh, an energy partitioning model. I talked about strain partitioning. We use an energy partitioning model, and so on. Okay. Uh, this just shows some zoom in of those. Uh, 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 so same pictures, finite element model. Here's the hysteresis in the, in the critical part of the solder joint. That's where the corner solder joint is going to fail. So you can either take the strain range or the energy inside that hysteresis loop. My group takes the energy and partitions into creep and plasticity. Other groups use uh, strain range. Okay. Okay. Um, and then some groups get even more, uh, uh, more. So for example, Darvo and his research group get more detailed. So they use uh, this kind of a model, uh, these, these models to predict when the crack starts, and then use fracture mechanics concepts to predict when it's going to propagate to failure. So they actually add a propagation. DADN is the propagation rate of the crack. They actually do a propagation uh, calculation and add that to the crack initiation. Okay. OK, so interest of time, let's, OK, now let's talk about the energy partitioning. So this is what my group does. So instead of accounting for the frequency and the temperature in the exponent the way Engelmeyer does, we simply say, let the finite element model tell us what portion of this deformation or what portion of this energy was due to creep, what portion was due to plasticity, and answer. So Abacus will explicitly output that for you. And uh, then we go into separate fatigue models. We say we know that creep deformation causes a different kind of damage, so it, that has a different SN curve than plastic deformation, so the SN curve, the fatigue curves, are different for creep and plastic deformation. So the finite element tells us what portion of our deformation is plastic, what portion is creep, and then we go into these fatigue curves and see for each of those portions of plastic and creep deformation, what's the uh, fatigue damage. Then we add up that total fatigue damage, and that lets us pretty, uh, predict cycles to failure. Okay? That's how we do it in our group. Okay. Uh, one further uh, quirk on that, the creep damage is a function of how much compressive or tensile hydrostatic stress you put on the joint. Why is that important? Because when you deform this, not only do you get shear strains, you also get compressive hydrostatic strains or tensile hydrostatic strains. And it turns out the fatigue curves are sensitive to that. So you have to correct the fatigue curves to the amount of hydrostatic strain, uh, stress, and uh, we do have a way of doing that also. OK, let's uh, move on here. So obviously, all of these models, the data comes from uh, e experimental results. So we spend a lot of time uh, building test, I wouldn't say test coupons, but test structures, and then uh, doing accelerated temperature cycling tests on those. Then we do finite element models of those structures, find the strain values, and that's how we get these model constants. So all the, the intercepts and the slopes of these fatigue curves are the model constants. So those are the exponents and the, and the coefficients in front are fatigue constants. And those we extract out of a uh, lot of experimental results. So we do a lot of this kind of thermal testing, find the strain levels and e energy levels by finite elements, and then calibrate the constants. OK. OK. Um, that's just more and more examples of details of finite element modeling. Skip over all that. Skip over that. Those are details of finite element models. So this talks about uh, to use the finite element models, you need the right creep models, right plasticity models. So there are sophisticated models out there, many choices of models there too. Some groups use uh, uh, models like this, where the amount of creep strain rate is a function of stress, a complicated function of stress and an erroneous function of temperature. Okay? And then uh, in my group, we use models like this where we do partitioning. Because our fatigue models are partitioned, we do par partitioned uh, stress strain curves, elastic deformation. Plastic deformation is parallel dependence of stress and strain. And then the creep portion has erroneous dependence on temperature. And again, not too far different from these guys, sine hyperbolic and a power sine hyperbolic and a power, okay? So that's a dependence on stress. So these kinds of models come from the literature. We did not invent these. These come from the literature, and there are many such models in the literature. We just picked the one that appears most appropriate to us. 
Okay, uh, skip over some of these. These are details of finite element results. Uh, yeah, skip over these. So this is just an example of how we go through and try to do predictions with finite elements and see how close they get to experiments. So uh, you can see that uh, some got to within 50%. That's considered pretty good. Some got to within 30%. That's also considered pretty good. In fatigue modeling, anything less than a factor of two is considered a reasonably good fit. So I would say these are pretty good predictions. Okay. Okay. Let's uh, then comes high cycle fatigue. Uh, so there we are talking about vibration loading where the strain levels are not quite as high. Now you're talking about the high cycle part of the fatigue curve. Okay. Uh, again, you need model constants. You need the slope. You need the exponent. And then if you have that, you can find uh, uh, time to failure for vibration loading using the high cycle part of the fatigue curve. Okay, so we find those with uh, either vibration tests or mechanical tests. So here, for example, we built some test coupons or test components with uh, resistors on a board. And then we put bending loads on the cyclic bending loads on those to measure the, uh, measure the model constants here, the slope and the exponent for the high cycle fatigue curve. So we put them on uh, mechanical test frames, do cyclic bending. So you go back and forth. This is called four point cyclic bending. Ultimately, the strain, uh, solder joints will fail. And we measure the number of cycles to failure. We find out the strain levels through finite elements. And that's how we make the fatigue curves. Uh, that's just uh, monitoring for. Uh, so we put strain gauges on them so we can measure how much deformation we are putting on the board. Okay, and then we find out cycles to f measure the cycles to failure, get Weibull plots, and then take the Weibull mean, which is the eta, okay, and then uh, find out uh, uh, the model constants. So you can see there are multiple experiments here. This had more severe bending. This this is the bending of the circuit card. Okay, 2,000 micro strain is the bending of the circuit card measured with that strain gauge, and this was 1,200 micro strain. So this is loaded less severely. This is a lot of bending. So you can see, not surprisingly, these failed earlier, cycles to failures in the horizontal axis. This lasted longer. And then the circles are tin lead solder. The squares are uh, lead-free tin silver copper solder. Okay. okay, so these are bending test results, not vibration. Vibration goes to much higher strain rates. These are slow strain rates, what we call quasi-static. Okay. Uh, and these are some of the bent test results. We use these to build up our fatigue curves. And uh, of course, to build up the fatigue curves, you need two axes. This is the cycles to failure. I also have to be able to predict what's the strain in the solder joint. This is the strain in the board. I have to pr predict the corresponding strain in the solder joint. And we use finite elements to do that. So we create the finite element. We give the board that amount of bending that we had in the test. And then find out, let the finite element tell us what is the strain level in the solder joint. And that's how we get the high cycle part of the fatigue curve. So you can see the constants are over here. Sigma f prime is that constant. This is the high cycle fatigue. B is minus 0.12. So that's how we extracted those fatigue constants out from those bent tests. OK, and uh, then we can use those to predict cycles to failure for other cases. And you can see our experimental results are all falling somewhere close to the prediction curve that we have, okay, with those constants. Okay, and then SAC. So uh, this was tin, uh, tin lead, okay, that was our model for tin lead. Here you can see where the SAC models are and the corresponding data. But this is, again, I'll remind you on the slow loading. If you go to high strain rate loading, the SAC curve falls below the tin lead curve, okay? Okay, so the loading rate is, again, very important. OK, so for vibration, which is high, uh, high cycle fatigue at high strain rate, we have a fairly complex method we have for that. So you have to do vibration analysis to know how much the board is responding. Once you know how much the board is responding, then you can find the strains in the solder joint. And then you can see how it compares to SN curves. Or you can use that data to extract SN curves. So I'll skip over the details of the steps. There's no time for that. We did a very extensive study where we took those circuit cards, subjected them to vibration loading, okay, uh, mount clamped them along the two edges. The purpose of the accelerometers and strain gauges are to see how much deformation we're getting in the circuit card. I'm going very rapidly through this. And then uh, applied that much deformation to our finite element model to find what's the strain levels in the solder joints, okay. 
And uh, so those are the detailed models, applied that much definition to the circuit card, found out the strain levels in the solder joints. And uh, this is where things get complicated. At high strain rates, the solder stress strain curve gets very complicated. It's a function of strain rate, loading rate. So in vibration where the strain rates are very high, uh, the pr uh, stress strain curves change with strain rate. So you can see in this graph, or in this graph, low strain rate, this is how it looks. High strain rate, that's how it looks. It looks very different, okay? And this is just a 3D version of that. Stress on vertical axis, strain on the horizontal axis, and strain rate on the other axis, okay? So it gets pretty complicated. So, but that's what we are using in these, in these finite element models. We are using those rate sensitive uh, stress strain curves. So when you do that, you can actually extract, sorry, you can actually extract the stress strain curves and we have run these tests at many different temperatures to find out how the stress, uh, I'm sorry, the fatigue curves, not stress strain, extract the fatigue curves and you can find out how those fatigue curves change as a function of temperature. Okay, so we actually have the ability uh, or the, or the uh, test uh, uh, chamber to run those, hmm, no picture, where is our picture? Nah, I don't have that picture. So what I can do is I can uh, enlarge, zoom into one of these. The picture is not very good, unfortunately, but you'll get a feel for it. Let's, nope, I don't have a picture anywhere. So basically we have uh, vibration shakers inside our environmental temperature chamber, so we can actually run these vibration tests at many temperatures, and that's what you're finding here we can generate fatigue curves at different temperatures as a result of that, okay? Okay, uh, last slide before lunch. Uh, in reality, we sometimes get combination of temperature and vibration, which is why we have that test chamber where we have vibration capability within the thermal chamber. And there what we do is we look at the low cycle fatigue damage from uh, thermal loading we look at the high cycle fatigue damage from vibration loading. We look at how many vibration cycle, the difference in the frequency of vibration and uh, thermal. That means per thermal cycle, how many vibration cycles do I have? Uh, use that as a weight factor and then add up the damage from both vibration and thermal and that tells us what the total damage is uh, for fatigue predictions. This is again a very simplified approach. This is, we are just superposing the thermal damage with the vibration damage. In the mechanical world, we call that linear superposition. That's called Miner's Rule. It works reasonably well as long as the vibration level and temperature levels are reasonably mi mild, which is what it usually is in the field. In accelerated testing, both are pretty severe and the simple model doesn't work. There you have, there's interaction, nonlinear interaction between temperature cycling and vibration. So we have much more complex nonlinear models for severe environments. We don't have the time or bandwidth to handle that model in today's presentation, so I'm just giving you the simple linear superposition model, which still works reasonably well in the field, where your vibration levels and temperature levels are not that severe. Does not work uh, uh, very well in accelerated uh, testing. We have other methods for that, okay? Okay, we have uh, five minutes to one. Let's stop over here. Uh, let me end by going back to the course outline just to tell you what we have time left for for the afternoon. So we have limited time in the afternoon, uh, three o'clock to 4.30, that's it. Because 4.30 we are gonna switch over to the exam. So we have covered the pure fundamentals and I've given you a simple design example where we talked about how we account for solder joint fatigue in uh, thermal cycling and vibration situations. I'll talk a little bit about accelerated testing, three o'clock to four o'clock, okay? And I don't think we'll have time for prognostics and health management. So the afternoon session will be reserved for just discussing how do we use these physics of failure models to design accelerated stress tests, okay? In other words, the correct answer for that is, or the correct way to pose that question is, how do you find acceleration factors for when you raise the stress levels, how do you find the acceleration factors from these models? That's all we'll talk about. Four different kinds of failure mechanisms. I'll give you three or four examples. Electrochemical migration, corrosion, electromigration, uh, fatigue. How do you get acceleration factors? Because each one has a different kind of failure model. Therefore, the acceleration factors look somewhat, the equations for acceleration factors look different. 
we'll walk through a few of those just to give you some examples. Okay? All right, let's take a lunch break. Thank you. <laughs>